It gives me great pleasure to chair this morning's panel and to introduce our speakers. Professor Michael Largi, Professor Martin Monroe, and Professor Barbara Browning. One of the things that I think this morning's panel is going to really bring home is the extraordinary diversity of the Haitian Revolution's cultural afterlife. Not only has the revolution inspired imaginative representations and recuperations by a host of esteemed Caribbean and African-American writers and artists, including, to name just a few, um, a few prominent examples, C.L.R. James, M.A. Césaire, Langston Hughes, Ralph Ellison, Jacob Lawrence, and Alejo Carpentier. And before them, works by writers as various as Wordsworth, von Kleist, and William Faulkner. Uh, the revolution has also inspired creative works in film, music, and dance. And these will be under discussion in this morning's panel, I think. Um, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Professor Michael Largi is Professor of Ethnomusicology and Area Chair of Musicology at Michigan State University College of Music. He is a specialist in Caribbean music, specifically Haitian classical and religious music. He is author of Voodoo Nation, Haitian Art and Music, and Cultural Nationalism, in which he examined how elements of voodoo music were used by elite composers to express understandings of nation, nation, from the 1890s through to the US military occupation of 1915 to 1934. Uh, Professor Largi's paper this morning is titled 1804 and Musical Memory, Oxy Jonti and the Recombinant Mythology in Haiti. Thank you, Philip, and uh, thanks uh, to, uh, to my host here at Nottingham. I've uh, had a wonderful time, and I really appreciate uh, him, uh, including me in this, uh, in this uh, conference. I'm, I'm very privileged to be here with, uh, with uh, esteemed colleagues, many of whom, whose works I admire uh, and uh, who I've not yet had the pleasure of meeting, so that's, it's been a, a special treat for me in that way. Um, as the Kafu Haiti Art and Voodoo Exhibition shows in colorful detail the relationships between Haitian historical events, religious life, and artistic practice are closely intertwined. Although most of the attention to this relationship has been paid to the visual arts, today I will discuss how music, specifically Haitian art music or la musique savante haitienne, has been used to underscore concepts of nationalism within Haiti. In my earlier work on Haitian art music, I suggested that elite Haitian composers employed what I called modes of cultural memory to engage issues from Haitian history as a way to make significant claims about Haiti's place in the world. In this presentation, I will explain one such mode of cultural memory that I call recombinant mythology in order to show that mythological ideas have a powerful shaping influence on Haitians' understanding of their political realities. My focus today will be on Haitian military band director, Oxy Janty, who lived from 1860 to 1936, and who was seen by Haitian audiences as a defender of the Haitian nation during the United States occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934. I suggest that in order to understand Janty's importance as an artistic and political figure, it's necessary to develop an historical model that examines the legendary accounts of Janty's life that have been infused with Haitian myths. Myth and history are elements of, a larger discursive, of larger discursive processes that forge relationships with the past. As Haitian historian and anthropologist Michel of Trouillot points out, quote, theories of history rarely examine in detail the concrete production of specific narratives, end quote. But specific narratives matter, particularly in the case of Gentil, whose career began during a time when Haitian politicians were actively cultivating connections with the deceased heroes of the 1791 to 1804 War for Haitian Independence, and especially with Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the first ruler of independent Haiti. While late 19th century Haitian intellectuals strove to connect themselves rhetorically with Dessalines' qualities of bravery, courage, and industry, Lower class Haitians had already begun the process of incorporating the legend of Dessalines into the practice of Haitian traditional religion. Unlike the heroic image of Dessalines favored by Haitian politicians, the Haitian lower class image of Dessalines focused on his death and dismemberment in 1806 by his political rivals. 
as Ogun de Salin, who's uh, already come up uh, a couple of times in, uh, in previous presentations, a mythological fusion of the historical de Salin and the West African-derived spirit Ogun, de Salin's newly embodied form as a voodoo spirit, or Loa, fused two compelling and contradictory ideas, the powerful general who protected the Haitian state from invasion and the dismembered corpse torn asunder by his enemies. Despite their differences, both elite and lower class visions of de Salin's legacy were concerned with connecting contemporary Haitians with the rhetorical power of politics and myth. As Haitian politicians have discovered, formulating mythologically inflected rhetoric about de Salin initiated a process whereby politicians were incorporated into the very myths they sought to exploit. In the case of Oxygenti, narratives about his bravery, loyalty, and courage draw upon the recombinant myths of de Salin and Ogun in which heroic rhetoric associated with defending the Haitian nation is infused with ideas from Haitian traditional religion. While the, analysis of myth, while the analysis of myth does not replace conventional methodologies for the production of historical narratives, it's, in, it's an important part of the formation of an historical consciousness, especially in places like the Caribbean, where written history has privileged colonialist perspectives. Colin Diane has suggested the term voodoo history as a corollary for the combination of mythical and historical narratives in Haiti. Calling such accounts sinkholes of excess, Diane asserts that, quote, these crystallizations of unwritten history force us to acknowledge the inventions of mind and memory that destroy the illusions of mastery, that circumvent and confound any master narrative. And I should add here that uh, in, in the published version of this, I, I go on at some length talking about the, uh, the connections, the historical connections between uh, Ogun, the, the voodoo spirit, Jean-Jacques de Saline, and uh, Florio Hippolyte, uh, who is the president of Haiti and who uh, who died in uh, 1896 after having a heart attack on, the, uh, um, on his way to, um, to uh, defeat an adversary. Uh, the, uh, and I, spend, I don't have time today to talk about it, but uh, there are many songs actually that, uh, that refer to this uh, historical event and that, uh, in, in, in which I argue they uh, help to kind of fuse this story of, of, uh, of Desalines with, um, with Hippolyte and uh, probably the most famous of which is the Haitian song, which is well known to, uh, to many people outside Haiti, Panama Tombe, uh, which, uh, uh, for those who don't know it, Moins sorti la ville Jacmel, la vallée moins pralé, en arrivant Cafou Bene, Panama Tombe, I'll skip to the chorus, Panama Tombe, Panama Tombe, Panama Tombe, ça qui dérame les poumons. So it's a merengue, uh, which is a, uh, a very popular dance form uh, from the uh, from the mid 19th century uh, through into the well into the 20th century, uh, but the uh, the song, the, the lyrics are uh, talking about him going to uh, to Jacques Mel, uh, going um, uh, when I got uh, when I got to the the crossroads uh, of uh, Benet, uh, my hat fell down. Of course, uh, the the falling hat is a uh, a metaphor for a number of things. One, this impending. Uh, uh, sort of fate that, that, that awaits him, uh, his, uh, his uh, dying, uh, which is kind of foreshadowed by the hat. Of course, also a, a, uh, uh, the significance of the hat is also quite important because in, uh, in Haitian folklore, uh, the land of the dead is called pays sans chapeau, or the land without hats, the country without hats. Um, uh, and I would also direct the people up to the, um, the painting by uh, Philomé Aubin upstairs, uh, Les Cacos de le Comte, uh, which uh, very prominently features uh, a a, uh, a red bridge, which I think is uh, signifying, uh, relating back to uh, Dessalines uh, meeting his, uh, his untimely death on the red bridge, the Pont Rouge. Uh, at the same time, the, the, the painting is framed, uh, is, is kind of labeled by a, um, a sign on the top, which talks about Hippolyte, President d'Haïti, uh, in uh, 1896, the year uh, that, he, that he perished. So uh, when we look at that, uh, looking at that painting, at least for me, I was telling Alex when I, when I came in, that uh, when I found when I saw that painting, it just about I just about dropped my computer uh, when I came around the corner because it, to me it was uh, very rich with uh, with symbolism. And I'll talk a little bit about how that symbolism works um, a little bit later in the paper. Myths that have salience in the present, however, may be used by contemporary subjects in traditionalizing processes that connect contemporary situations with the past. One type of traditionalizing process in which historical narratives are infused with mythological ideas is what I term recombinant mythology, or the process whereby people in the present 
use mythologically oriented language to highlight praiseworthy characteristics of cultural heroes. Recombinant mythology makes historical events more culturally saturated and hence more subject to interpretation by culturally competent audiences. Recombinant myths begin with connection. People in the present make a demonstrable link to some idea, practice, person, or event in the past that carries contemporary significance. Ogun is a particularly effective point of connection for recombinant mythology in Haiti. He is known primarily as a soldier. Ogun brandishes his machete as part of his possession performance and often wears the sash of a Haitian military officer. Uh, in addition, Alex was talking about uh, Ogun being also connected with iron, uh, with warfare, and also with taxi drivers. Uh, he didn't mention that, but uh, in fact, uh, Ogun is, associate, is the patron of taxi drivers, and if you've ever been in a cab in Port-au-Prince, you'd know why. Uh, in the case of Dessalines and Ogun, their affinities come from their shared associations with the military. Both the Haitian president and the voodoo spirit are identified as brave and selfless soldiers willing to put themselves in physical danger despite the risk. Recombinant myths uh, bring the present and the past together in specific discursive forms, but they don't replace alternative explanations of the past. They exist in what Homi Baba calls the third space, where they are available to use in a myriad of ways, some of which may be in direct contradiction with each other. In the third space, ideas coexist in contrary and competitive forms, available for use depending on the specific context. In Haiti, voodoo spirits, or loi, are often used as sources of recombinant myths and can be, as Mac Karen McCarthy Brown shows, moral exemplars whose possession performances demonstrate particular points. In the case of Ogun, the power he wields is neither good nor bad. It's, it is his relationship with power that makes him a focal point for his followers. Recombinant myths made in the present with ideas of the past are not arbitrary, however. They cannot be formed with just any ideas selected from the past. Recombinant myths involve combination or the alignment of salient traits between appropriate subjects. They are made between ideas that are, to paraphrase Claude Lévi-Strauss, good to think together. Ogun, the patron of the Haitian soldier statesman, combines with Haitian generals and presidents whose power eventually overcame them. Other legendary Haitian generals, such as Toussaint Louverture and Henri Christophe, are rarely depicted as having Ogun characteristics. While they're both regarded as Haitian heroes, their stories don't lend themselves well to combination with Ogun. And the question came up yesterday about the significance of uh, kind of you know, Haitian embrace of, uh, of the Dessalines figure and a kind of foreign rejection of that. And I guess and part of what I argue in, uh, in Voodoo Nation is that uh, it's, it's because uh, many uh, Haitian and, um, and black artists outside Haiti uh, engage the Dessalines uh, story because it, uh, I think it promotes uh, a view of black agency uh, without trying to curry favor with white audiences. But uh, that's just you know, the, maybe the, the beginning of a conversation we can have about uh, that later. Um, the final stage of recombinant mythology is transformation, or the emergence of a recombinant myth in a specific place and time. When a recombinant myth is transformed, it takes its place in a concatenated chain of narratives, each of which is simultaneously linked to specific historical and mythological antecedents. While voodoo ceremonies are most often the focus of Haitian mythological analysis, writers and intellectuals from the upper echelons of Haitian society participate in the creation of a Haitian historical consciousness through their mythologically inflected recountings of Haitian historical events. Such intellectuals may be termed alchemists of memory, as Michel of Trouillot has called them, quote, proud guardians of a past that neither lived nor wished to have shared, end quote. While Trouillot was referring specifically to his own family's involvement in a cultural society focused on the achievements of Henri Christophe, I suggest that his sobriquet may be applied to those members of Haitian society who use voodoo mythology as part of their cultural vocabulary despite their personal repudiation of Haitian traditional religion. As alchemists of memory, Haitian intellectuals use voodoo as a cultural resource to enliven their own writing and to saturate their prose with culturally resonant ideas. And I would add that uh, it's, not, it's not only musicians uh, and, uh, and writers uh, who, who do this, I, I think also artists do as well. I was uh, talking to Alex before uh, coming in this morning and just mentioning that uh, in many ways the paintings upstairs, some of which are painted by people who, who do repudiate voodoo, and yet uh, despite the fact that they, they don't express uh, or they don't connect visually specifically with any uh, particular aspect of the voodoo ceremony, their works are informed by a, a kind of cultural practice in Haiti. And I would say, I was watching one of the, the film Dreamers up, up there, and I, I saw uh, uh, Sanna Philippe Auguste, who, who, I, who I 
knew before he passed away. I, I'm friends with his uh, son. And uh, just hearing him talk about how he doesn't put voodoo in it, and then of course the next image is one that's clearly derived from, uh, that, that, has, that has great uh, kind of compatibility with, uh, with voodoo imagery. I don't think he was, uh, he was not being insincere. Uh, rather, he was just saying that there are different ways to be able to interpret this, this imagery, and this imagery is a shared resource among, among people. For elite audiences, the characteristics that embody a complex voodoo spirit are too volatile for use in their competing and contradictory forms within the voodoo history. They need to be diluted into forms that both stir the patriotic passions of Haitian audiences and connect them to salient cultural images. The production of history, especially in Haiti, must take into account a range of cultural expressions about the past. Gentil's importance to Haitian audiences is documented in what V.V. Clark has called, after Pierre Nora, uh, quote, uh, milieu de mémoire, discrete regional remembrances beyond the pale of official history, so insignificant as to be known only to practitioners, a living chronology revealed to members only, end quote. These milieux de mémoire include such disparate genres as, Haitian, uh, as myths, legends about Gentil's prowess as a musician and patriot, personal narratives by Gentil's contemporaries in which his positive traits were selected and magnified through heroic rhetoric, poems written about Gentil which blurred the distinction between his actual role in historical events and his inspirational value, and a genre that I term experiential programs or personal interpretive statements made by audience members upon listening to a piece by Oxy Gentil. And those are probably the most compelling uh, pieces of evidence since they, they directly link him with the voodoo despite his uh, lack of participation in it. Uh, during my field work in Haiti during the 1980s, I documented many of these unofficial remembrances of Gentil. Most accounts included the official details, that Gentil was the director of the uh, uh, Haitian presidential band from the 1880s until 1916, when he was relieved of his duties by Haitian President Sud uh, Dartiganov. In 1922, Gentil was reinstated to his position as director of the presidential band by President Louis Bourneau. Between 1922 and the end of the U.S. occupation in 1934, Gentil composed musical works that contributed to the rhetorical resistance toward the U.S. occupation. Gentil's most famous composition, 1804, became an unofficial anthem of Haitian resistance and political autonomy until the end of the occupation in 1934. Despite the fact that 1804 was written in commemoration of the centennial of Haitian independence in 1904, and not specifically written as a political protest march, Haitian audiences heard a connection between the presence of the US occupation forces and the last time white foreigners held Haitians in chains during the colonial period. The march became an anthem of anti-American resistance for Haitians and continues to have revolutionary connotations for Haitian audiences. Written accounts of the period, as well as several interviews I conducted with Haitians who remembered Gentil, recounted how when 1804 was played by the presidential band with Oxy Gentil directing, Haitian audiences spontaneously rioted in the streets of Port-au-Prince, voicing their anger and frustration at the United States' occupation of their country. Previously, active resistance to the American regime was confined to the countryside where armed bands of cacos engaged, in US, engaged the U.S. Marines in small skirmishes. The U.S. military presence, which was initially embraced by bourgeois Haitians, had met little open resistance in Port-au-Prince, so the urban response to 1804 was especially significant. During the latter part of the occupation, Gentil was forbidden to play 1804 with the band during their popular Sunday concerts in the Champs de Mars. Several writers tried to explain the power that 1804 seemed to have over Haitian audiences. Journalist Félix Hérissé penned a program for Gentil's 1804 that linked the musical gestures of the march to the struggles of General Dessalines against the French army. Hérissé's program elides musical gestures with the scenes of war. The bases call upon troops to charge the enemy, while the trombones imitate the moans of wounded Haitian soldiers. Hérissé's program comes to its dramatic climax when it recalls Dessalines' battle cry, Dessalines parle oui blanc, or Dessalines doesn't want to see whites. In the program, Gentil enacts the revolutionary struggle between the Haitians and French, French forces. Both Dessalines and Gentil call for the expulsion of the white invader, thus symbolically linking the two Haitian soldiers by their struggles in preserving the integrity of the Haitian nation. In Hérissé's program, Gentil is able to accomplish what the Haitian military could not, a symbolic defeat of the forces of white oppression. In addition, Hérissé's program turns the historical event of Dessalines' bravery into a performative act that demands that Haitian listeners position themselves in the struggle for independence. 
As Haitians commemorated the first Haitian Revolution, they performed the second Haitian Revolution against the forces of U.S. occupation. And what I'd like to do is uh, listen to uh, a bit of the piece right now. This is a recording uh, from a 78 uh, RPM uh, recording, so it's a bit scratchy. There's some pops on it, but uh, you'll be able to hear uh, the piece. And I just want to uh, draw your attention to, uh, we'll, we'll play it up until the uh, break strain where it goes, dum ba dum bum 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 beam bum 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 uh, which, uh, according to everybody that I uh, interviewed, is the line uh, that goes with, des salines pavlés oui bien, Right, kill them. Uh, so that is the. Uh, so that's that's what we're listening for. Uh, I guess I'd also like you to, um, uh, as you're listening to it, uh, I'd like to see uh, to what extent uh, there are uh, that you hear things in this that uh, could possibly, let's say, uh, fill out this experiential program that ABC uh, provides us. I'll give you another one a little bit later. But uh, just uh, as you're listening to this, uh, keep in mind the uh, the historical reference that it's making and the associations that Haitian audiences had with it at that time. So, Several writers tried to explain the power that 1804 seemed to hold over Haitian audiences. Uh, nope, that's not what I want. Haitian audiences have continued to assign 1804 extra musical characteristics, traditionalizing it in form and content, as well as historical importance. Um, when heard by a Haitian audience today, 1804 can elicit dramatic, visceral responses from sympathetic listeners. In one interview I conducted, a listener described the physical sensations a Haitian might feel when listening to a performance of 1804. Quote, uh, when a Haitian hears 1804, all the hair on his head stands on end. All the hair on his arms stand up. He thinks we're not going to accept an invasion that will return us to slavery, end quote. He added that the sensitivity to the programmatic message of 1804 was something that had to be learned and experienced by audience members. He told me that, quote, when you hear 1804, you don't hear it the same way I hear it, end quote. What Haitian audiences hear, however, has been conditioned by the social and political contexts in which 1804 has been played. As ethnomusicologist Tom Torino has observed, quote, the affective potential of music is constantly utilized and in some cases manipulated for a variety of highly significant social ends, including the mobilization of collectivities to create or defend a nation, end quote. In the case of 1804, Its power as a musical sign was derived not only from its symbolic linking of Haitian resistance in the war for independence and the U.S. occupation, but also from the emotional response expected of Haitian audiences upon hearing the work. Uh, another Haitian poet, uh, Frédéric Beurreno, wrote uh, Hommage to Oxygenti 1804, an experiential program in the form of a poem. As Beurreno's poem uh, describes, quote, marches, war songs, and 1804 where the splendor of the glorious past returns and which moves the crowd at the end of the bluish evening with wild shouts in memory of the ancestors, end quote. Even during a military occupation of their country, Haitian audiences were able to imagine themselves resisting political oppression. The wild shouts of contemporary listeners con connect them with cultural values of independence, rejection of colonialism, and resistance towards the reimposition of slavery. 
Messages embedded in performative display are, at least in Haiti, dependent on audience members' abilities to understand and appreciate them. As many theorists of, of Haitian culture have pointed out, uh, Haitian performative genres send messages, or voyer point, that is to throw or send a point, to Haitian audiences. Associated with the densely layered meanings of voodoo songs, points are often used in Haiti in rhetorical situations when direct confrontation or aggression would be too dangerous. During the US occupation, songs critical of the occupation government allowed Haitian audiences to share subversive ideas through the consumption of performative practices that required insider cultural knowledge. In the case of 1804, Haitians could symbolically reenact the struggle for Haitian independence as long as their enthusiasm remained within the bounds of acceptable behavior for the U.S. Marines. The performance of 1804 with Oxygenti directing the presidential band was a simulacrum of Dessalines' historic battle with foreign forces. As Haitian poet Jean Briere pointed out, the combination of the inflammatory music and the patriotic band leader made it impossible for Haitian audiences to control themselves when Gentil performed the work on the Champ de Mars. Point, however, are not limited to singular, to singular insider interpretations. Part of the pleasure of interpreting a point lies in audiences' abilities to assign new meanings to cultural performances. According to Haitian pianist and music educator Micheline Dalancourt, 1804 was rumored to have contained musical quotations from different military regiments in the Haitian army. Provincial bands had their own identifying themes which they could use to excite local crowds. According to Dalancourt, uh, Depes Salnave, a flutist and music teacher at the Institution, Institution de Saint-Louis de Gonzague, told his students that, in each, that each musical theme in 1804 represented Haitians from all parts of the country, bringing the people together thematically as well as emotionally. Salnave added that the war cry tune in 1804 was associated with the 6th Demi-Brigade, the military unit closest to Dessalines in the war for Haitian independence. According to Salnave, the war cry theme should properly be sung to the words de Salines Pavle Way Blanc, as we saw uh, earlier. Ultimately, it's less important that Salnave's musical etymology for the war cry is accurate than it is to note that Gentil's music continues to provide a focus for Haitian nationalist sentiments. When Oxy Gentil wrote band music before and during the US occupation of Haiti, his own invocation of the Emperor de Salines in such pieces as 1804 allowed Haitian audiences to experience the thrill of Haitian nationalist resistance without having to resort to combat. Gentil's image has been traditionalized by Haitian audiences who have used historical as well as folkloric ideas to place him in the historic past while equating him with the heroes of the Haitian independence in his own time as a defender of the Haitian state and in the present as a symbol of resistance against oppression. Thank you. Professor Monroe. Uh, professor Martin Monroe is Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Florida State University, specializing in Francophone Caribbean literature and culture. He is the author of Shaping and Reshaping the Caribbean, the work of Aimé Césaire and René de Peste, and Exile and Post-1946 Haitian Literature, Alexis de Peste, Olivier, La Ferrière, Danticat. He co-edited Reinterpreting the Haitian Revolution and its Cultural Aftershocks, and Echoes of the Haitian Revolution, and is a member of the editorial collective of the journal Small Axe. Uh, Professor Munro's paper this morning is titled The Revolution's Ghosts, Dessalines, the Chimere, and Apocalyptic Creolization. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it's still morning, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, good morning, and thanks. Um, I want to, to echo um, Michael and, and thanking the organisers, um, Isabel, Alex, Leah, and Emma, for um, for their kind invitation here, and also to congratulate them on, on this event and also the, the, the wonderful exhibition that you put together. Um, so my paper today is um, is called The Revolution's Ghost, Desley and the Chimere, an apocalyptic creolization. And in the paper, I explore the idea of the hybrid creolized subject in Haiti as a kind of living phantom. 
To do so, I move forward from the revolution in time 200 years to just before the bicentenary, uh, a time that seemed to usher back into Haitian society figures that appear to echo in many ways the, the figure of the Creole Dessaline in their ambiguous contradictory values, actions, and relations to broader Haitian society. These figures are the so-called chimères, the term used to refer to the gangs from the shanty towns of Port-au-Prince who were used at times in the service of jean bertrand Aristide's government and who developed a reputation for extreme violence used against the anti-government popular movement. Beginning with a discussion of the origins of the Chimère, I will then focus on three works in which the Chimère figure prominently. The documentary films, um, well, I don't think Ghost of City Soleil is, is properly a documentary, but, um, and, well, do, Ghost of City Soleil is the first film, the, the second was Haïti, la fin de Chimère, and then I look at Lionel Trouillot's novel, Bicentenaire. In all but Trouillot's work, the prominent Chimère brothers, known as Billy and Tupac, are featured which allows one to move from the general conceptions of the Chimère into the particular realities of these individual lives. So, in a recent article, Deborah Jensen raises the issue of Creole identity in Haiti in relation to the independent country's first leader. Was Jean-Jacques Dessalines a Creole or an African, she asks. Jensen questions the standard interpretation offered by mid to late 20th century historiography, namely that Dessalines was literally Creole born in the colony, sorry, literally, literally Creole that is born in the colony, yet performatively and ideologically African. The standard version has Dessaline as an island-born Creole who was brutally treated by a white master and who could, in the composite stories that make up his popular legend, gesturally, figuratively become African to relate to the majority African-born population of Haiti. In such a version, as Colin Dyan says, we are dealing with a, with a Creole who could take on the role of an African as easily as he could serve the French. Jensen, by contrast, discusses contemporaneous accounts that say that Dessaline was born in Africa and explores the possibility that, Des, that Dessaline's case is not so much one of becoming African as one of becoming Creole in later historiography. Her fundamental interest lies in the ways in which narratives of Dessaline's Creole or African birth have shaped understandings of the Haitian Revolution. If Dessaline was not a Creole but born in Africa and taken born in Africa and taken as a slave to Haiti, where he used his knowledge of African social groups in the service of the revolution, he would represent, Jensen says, and I quote, a critical suppressed link, if an endlessly oblique one, in our understanding of how these experiences informed African revolutionary agency in colonial Saint Domingue. In a sense, if Dessaline were confirmed as African-born, his story would be simplified. For Dessaline the Creole is an endlessly complex and contradictory entity, an island-born individual who could relate directly to the diverse African groups of the colony, and who could, as Diane suggests, even become African. Dessaline is, in this version, a chameleon that comes into being through metamorphosis, as Jensen says. As such, Dessaline the Creole is a kind of shapeshifter of unverifiable origins and contradictory motivations, unknowable and ambiguous, a kind of ghost, even as he lived. In the main part of the paper, I want to develop this idea of the hybrid creolized subject in Haiti, again, as a kind of living phantom. So I move forward, as I, as I say, 200 years to the, just before the, the bicentenary of the, the revolution and to the Chimere figures. The Chimere appear in literary and cinematic works as apocalyptic figures, grotesque, nihilistic refigurations of the creolized anti-hero that Ma Maximilien Laroche has written about. The paradoxes of Haitian politics complicate the question of ethics so that it's difficult to judge if the anti-hero is completely on the right side. In many works, the Chimere are part of an apocalyptic narrative that makes the city the site of a battle to the end. A crucial component in many contemporary apocalyptic narratives is that the killer needs a victim, while the self-condemned victim needs a killer, the one completes and validates the other. Beginning with a brief discussion of the origin of the Chimere, as I said before, um, I'm going to look at the two films and the, um, the Trouillot novel, Bicentenaire. The very name Chimere implies a form of apocalyptic creolization in its suggestion of a being made up of composite parts, a monster that is only part human or indeed a ghost, 
a phantom that is aware that is not fully alive, existing somewhere between life and death, existence and oblivion. And I say this in the knowledge that this is not a name chosen by the so-called Shemeber. It's, it's a term um, applied to them uh, pejoratively. Um, Perhaps fittingly, the genesis of the Shimer is difficult to trace and is tied up in the intricate history of street gangs and their political affiliations. Two of the most notorious Shimer, the brothers Winston Jean Barr and James Petit Frere, better known as Tupac and Billy, are said to have been alumni of Aristide's La, Fam La Famille C'est la Vie Institute for Street Children. The La Famille C'est la Vie program was founded in the mid-1980s. Rooted in Haiti's liberation theology movement, the project centered around an orphanage for street boys of the La Saline district. More generally, the project was conceived as, and I'm quoting here from Kovats Bernat, I quote, a new template of Haitian citizenship built on a foundational ideology that would support the pillars of the new post-coup nationalism, justice, reconciliation, democracy, and poverty with dignity. Guided by a philosophy of education that developed a radically politicized child identity, La Fanmi held the unique ambition of not only feeding street children, but also creating what Kovacs Bernat calls citizen children. Forcibly closed by government par paramilitaries in 1999, the La Fanmi nevertheless produced successive cohorts of boys and young men for whom street violence had been a means of survival and who allied that defensive instinct to the politicized sensibility that the educational program had fostered. There appears to be no evidence that all those attached to the Shimer had been through La Fanmi, but the direct link to key Shimer such as Billy and Tupac does seem to indicate that La Fanmi was an important training ground for at least some of the most prominent figures. In Michael Dybert's account, one gets a sense of the ways in which the street children became politicized through La Fanmi and the generally held perception that Aristide sought to improve the lot of the poor. Hailing from City Soleil, the shanty town on the northern edge of Port-au-Prince, Billy and Tupac were orphaned through the politically motivated killings of their parents. Attending for a time La Famille C'est la Vie, the orphans had become what Dybert calls uh, children of Aristide. And this, the next bit is a quote from Billy which he, in which he confided to um, Dybert, quote, we want to try and help our people, now President Aristide, has been the only president who has tried to do something for poor people like us. The curious ethical foundation of such an enterprise is suggested in a speech Billy made on behalf of the gangs of City Soleil in January 2002. President Titid, Billy read, the alphabetisation or literacy program cannot happen with war going on. Alpha économique cannot happen with war. No development can blossom if there is no peace in City Soleil. In that sense, President Titide, the only thing that can establish peace is to open another police substation in City Soleil. The interesting thing here is that the gangster's stated aim is to have stricter law enforcement through the establishment of a new police substation in the heart of their territory. This seems in turn to be the only means of achieving the broader objective of, of social improvement for their neighborhoods. The Chimere or at least their leaders, in this sense, appear as unwilling gangsters, forced into violence to achieve peace. As one gang member at the same meeting remarked, quote, we would give the guns up if we could, for who would want to live like this if they didn't have to? Such ethical paradoxes underpin many of the literary and filmic representations of the Chimere. Morality and ethics are often malleable, not based on rigid, rigid demarcations of right and wrong but subject to change according to context. The Chimere embodies and enacts the ethical paradoxes born of a social and political situation in which violence and the desire for social justice are often closely intertwined. The Chimere as a creolized, Dessalinian being is a shapeshifter, hyper-real and yet also imaginary, a product of dreams, fears and desires who remains forever elusive and unknowable between living and dying, a phantom of the past and of the future. These qualities are discernible in perhaps the best known representation of the Chimere to date, Danish director Asger Leth's 2006 film Ghosts of City Soleil. Itself a curious hybrid object, the film is a form of documentary, yet with elements of drama and reality TV that undercut its claims to represent 
an unmediated form of the truth. And I was, I was happy to hear from Leah last night more on the background of the making of the film, which, which um, underlines that idea that the, the film is far from um, an unmediated, unmediated form of the truth. It picks, picks up on the story of Billy and Tupac, though in a way that is quite different to the measured sociological treatment they receive in Michael Dybert's book. In the film, the Shimer are paraded before its intended Western audience as its exotic other. The film has a voyeuristic element that allows the viewer to pass into the existence of the film's cast for 90 minutes and then to leave it completely, strangely unmoved and only faintly unsettled by this representation of what it calls the most dangerous place on earth. The film does not undertake a serious investigation of the Chimere or the social and political context in which they came into being. Rather, it begins in Medias Res in 2004 um, with demonstrations in the streets and rebels closing in, as it says, which it says led Aristi to, quote, enlist the support of arm, arm gangs from the slums of City Soleil. The first human images of Tupac smoking in the dark. Um, if, I'm presuming a, a number of you will have seen the film, but it, that's, that's how the, the first image is of Tupac, and he's in the dark. He's, um, um, he's, he's lit from the front, but all you see behind him is, is darkness. Tellingly, his first words are about the future, or rather the difficulty of imagining this time to come. How my life gonna be, he asks. His ability to speak freely in English seems to add to his hybrid chimerical quality and to compound the sense that he and others like him are at once of this place and also do not belong. Tupac's question has a rhetorical quality as he shakes his head in response to his own question and can only answer by uttering twice, I don't know, I don't know. As he does so, he closes his eyes as if he is imagining his future or as if he cannot picture it without absenting himself momentarily from the place in which he lives. As he says later in City Soleil, quote, you never live long, always die young. The life of a chimere only hastens one's demise, for as he says later, the more you kill, the shorter your life is. As such, Tupac represents himself from the outset, perhaps unintentionally, as an apocalyptic figure, existing, not living, in the present, apparently unavailable to conceive of the future as anything other than a void, a blackness to which he returns as he closes his eyes. True to his chimerical, chameleon-like identity, Tupac plays many different roles. At various points, he is a benign gangster, a sensitive orphan poet, an attentive father, or a vulnerable lover. But he is also at times merciless. I'm Tupac, he says at one point. I'll eat you alive, and no one will ever know. While in many ways he is portrayed as ultra-real and an authentic gangster, he also seems to see himself as an imitation, a false being made up of other people. Out on the streets, driving through the neighborhood, a Tupac Shakur song comes on his car stereo, and he declares to the camera, that's the real Tupac, he says. By implication, Haitian Tupac is something other than real, a kind of actor whose identity is as elusive and unknowable to the viewer as it is to himself. Tupac's identity is also played against and to some extent determined by that of his brother, Billy. Again, there is a play of difference and sameness that seems to produce an individual's identity. Like Tupac, Billy is a chimere, but unlike Tupac, Billy appears to have a social and political conscience. While Tupac insists he is a thugster, a gangster, Billy, he says, wants to be president of Haiti, an ambition that is ultimately as unattainable as Tupac's to become an international rap star. While Billy wants to be president, Tupac scorns and derides his country. Fuck Haiti, man, he says. In effect, the brothers appear in some senses as two halves of a full being. Their identities in some senses cut in two dualistic parts, but also sharing the fundamental emptiness and despair that is the lot of the apocalyptic, creolized subject. Billy has a more nuanced understanding of, of affairs than does his brother. While Tupac seems to favor action, Billy thinks, more, sorry, Billy thinks more and appears more aware of the roles he is playing and for whom he is playing them. When the film begins to focus on him, he declares to the camera, we are on the microphone, 
we must have the power, a statement that indicates his awareness of the power play that the very making of the film involves, and that those who have the, the ability to speak and to be heard are those who control various forms of power. At the same time, Billy's conception of his life is in many ways as apocalyptic as that of his brother. At one point, he says that he cannot stop fighting for Aristide, for to do so would be to bring about his own demise. I stop, I die, as he puts it. For many in Cite Soleil, including Billy, it was Aristide who had been seen as a savior who would deliver the people from their misery. The film narrates the circumstances and some of the aftermath of Aristide's departure on February 29, 2004. And again, not in a particularly balanced or informed way. The power that the gangsters have is, is itself chimerical, an illusion that is quickly shattered when, following Aristide's departure, they are forced to disarm and the internal conflicts within their ranks come to the fore. Billy and Tupac are split by a bitter argument, and the former says he would kill the latter were he not his brother. Tupac appears increasingly lost, uncertain of his place in the community and indeed the country. His fatalistic, apocalyptic side comes to the fore once again. As their power dissolves, he says that all that is left is hatred and that he's going to die. Facing a warrant for his arrest, he feels trapped. He quotes Wycliffe John's phrase that when a door closes, another opens and finds it to be false as he encounters only closed doors. Perhaps ironically, it is at this point that Tupac in particular appears most human, that is most directly connected to the fundamental human emotions that he more commonly suppresses as a chimere. It is when he feels his life most threatened that he seems to become less ghost-like and to fully sense that he is alive, however precariously. When he hears that Billy has been arrested, he reacts as a brother would, their conflict apparently forgotten. Tupac's brotherly instinct is to protect and avenge Billy, and as if struck by the full tragedy of their lives, he breaks down in tears. His tears are also for his country, as he thinks of the cycle of Makut, Shimer, retribution, he says, Haiti will never be changed. His only desire now is to get money and to leave the country. Recalling his late mother as a good person who will now be in the skies, as he says, he reflects that the will, that he will not be joining her, as his eyes seem to express his sense of hopelessness and perhaps a degree of regret at the way he has lived his life. At this point, the film cuts back to the beginning, to Tupac's reflections on his life and his uncertainty over how it will turn out. So at the ending, we, we have the, we, what appears like a, um, a repeat of the, the beginning of the film with Tupac shot against darkness. How my life going to be, he asks again and replies, Lord knows. Or perhaps it is that the opening shots were, shots were actually from the end, which would certainly emphasize the, o the overwhelming sense that the film conveys of a place and an existence in which life is experienced as a form of death and where every beginning carries with it already an intimation of an ending. Billy reappears in a 2004 documentary by Charles Najman, Haiti la fin des chimères. More of a conventional documentary than the reality TV style Leth film, this work is situated at the turn of the bicentenary year and consists largely of a range of interviews with a broad spectrum of Haitian citizens, from writers and intellectuals to politicians, priests, students, and finally, Chimer. Recorded speeches by Jean-Bertrand Aristide, proclaiming Haiti's glorious past and demanding reparations from France, are set against the more muted reflections of intellectuals such as Gary Victor, who judges 1804 to have been a victory solely for the propertied classes and argues that, quote, we're still slaves. When Billy appears in the film, he cuts a more solitary, reflective figure than he did in Ghosts of City Soleil. With Tupac absent, Billy appears quite muted and all the more uncertain of his future. His initial dream, he says, was to become a militant revolutionary, to fight against governments that act against the people, as he puts it. He was, he says, willing to die for his political beliefs. Siti Soleil, he says, had many martyrs for Aristide's cause, and yet no improvement had been made to living conditions. He is filmed apparently taking a call from Aristide, in which he is told that the opposition will invade the palace and that the Chimer are the president's only hope. However, Billy is unsure whether to commit himself once again to Aristide. 
sitting around with some of his close associates, Billy reflects on the nature of the chimere. He appears to resent the tag as it is used as, as an insult by the opposition. Indeed, the name was coined by their opponents as a means of demonizing them. He is perceptive enough to see that the chimere are not a breed apart. Rather, he suggests they are a creation of the circumstances in which they live. The criminality that characterizes them is something, he says, that, quote, is in everyone's blood. Billy's disenchantment with the government is essentially an ethical and political matter. The great paradox in this regard is that Billy the gangster holds the government to account over its lack of ethics. It's a government of liars, he says. He decries the Haitian police force for being involved in drug dealing and judges that, quote, there is no truth in justice, everything's about money. Such is his despair that he sees the only solution as being a second period of American occupation, quite bizarrely, you might say, um, to his associates' protests on the importance of living independently, Billy's terse and telling reply is, but we don't live. In effect, Billy's politics and ethics appear to be fundamentally similar to those of the intellectuals and writers in the film, and most notably, Gary Victor, who also tends to deflate the perceived glories of Haitian history and who echoes Billy most directly in his declaration that successive governments have, quote, denied existence to the masses. The difference lies in the perceived legitimacy of the two figures. The writer is apparently untainted by political associations, while the gangster intellectual seems trapped by his economic circumstances and is caught in, in the paradox that the only way to make his plea for justice and truth is to first partake in violence. One imagines, finally, that were their situations reversed, Billy would be as eloquent as, as Victor and that Victor might act as Billy does which seems to affirm Billy's idea that he and every individual are the products of their circumstances, the political and economic forces that impact everyday lives with the force of destiny. Even in the absence of Tupac, therefore, the film seems to set up doubled relationships be between radically different characters that reveal themselves to be fundamentally alike. Such tendencies appear in certain contemporary fictional representations of the Chimere. Perhaps most notable in this regard is Lionel Trujillo's 2004 work, Bicentenaire, which is more or less contemporaneous with the films and which presents a doubled relationship between a student called Lucien and his younger brother, a chimere known as Little Joe. In comparison to the films, Trujillo's presentation of the chimere figure is less nuanced, at least at the beginning of the book. Little Joe apparently does not share the intellectual capacity of the figures presented in the films, especially Billy. The novel first presents little Joe sucking his thumb while sleeping, his face peaceful, quote, like childhood and fragile like it. The piece is deceptive, however, and he is further presented as a hybrid, creolized being. The fundamental rupture for Joe and his brother is with the countryside, their village of origin. Thus, Joe's face is that of, quote, a displaced angel, and it doesn't quite go with the rest of his body which is covered in tattoos. And this is a quote, Corvara, Wycliffe John, uh, Tim Duncan, shoot to kill, I want everything, peace and love. These are the tattoos that, that, that cover his body. His hybrid chimerical quality is further suggested in the stark difference between his sleeping state and his waking self. To wake is painful, violent, as Joe assumes his bodily identity, which, quote, signified at the same time everything and its opposite. In this sense, Joe's being is multiply split, and his body is covered in contradictory signs that suggest the conflicts that determine his every paradoxical act. While the doubled nature of the brothers is rather crudely drawn in the early part of the book, later the dualistic division becomes somewhat blurred. Lucien, for instance, doubts whether he has made the right choice in opting for, a, for peaceful protest, and wishes he, he had a gun too. He also seems susceptible to some of Joe's reasoning, Notably, the idea that, quote, it is in the flesh that you need to create pain. It is in the flesh that the world changes. By contrast, Lucian's only weapon is the old grammar book that he uses to teach the disinterested children of the rich. This student, moreover, recognizes the wisdom in Joe's violence. This is a quote. Even in his delirium, he manages to see the truth, Lucian says. 
the book's subtle validation of the Chimere figure and his ability to evolve and survive, Lucian dies in the book, apparently from a bullet from Joe's gun, is further affected through the mention of Joe's real name, Ezekiel. Um, the biblical prophecies of Ezekiel are said to mirror those in the book of Revelation. So it's clearly a, a, a reference to, to the, the biblical prophet um, Ezekiel. As such, uh, these biblical prophecies um, prophesy apocalyptic battles that herald the end times. Importantly, too, prophecy for the biblical Ezekiel was not just a matter of words. His life and actions were living prophecies. This is a quote from Ezekiel from the Bible. I am a sign to you, he said. As I have done, so it will be done to them. They will go into exile, into captivity. The behavior of the prophet, in this sense, constitutes a prophecy of the time to come. In this light, if we extend that, that idea to, to the novel, the character of little Joe Ezekiel embodies and enacts not only the present, but also the future. By extension, the Shimer more broadly constitute an apocalyptic army, a product of conflict in which, Truyo seems to suggest, one can read not only the contradictions of the present, but also the almost fated continuation of conflict in the time that will precede the final collapse. The prophetic figure also recalls Dessaline, the illiterate tyrant, the most unregenerate of Haitian le leaders, as Diane um, wrote, and the unsettling antithesis to the rational Toussaint. Like Dessaline, little Joe practices voodoo, the creolized religion. He had, quote, retained the memory of the mysteries and ritually spreads his red neckerchief on his bed, places on it a pin, three leaves of Artemisia, and an image of Saint-Jacques le Majeur, folds it up, puts it in his jeans pocket, picks up his glock, and crosses himself before setting out on his own particular battle. While the Chimere are in many senses products of Haiti's particular history, they are also part of a broader post-plantation world that remains haunted by its past, by what Diane terms, quote, the enchanted wreckage that was Atlantic slavery. Diane talks of the, the haunt of cruelty, the leavings of terror, and how in such a history the dead do not die. Drawing on Michel Rolf Trujillo's idea that the past is but a position and that in no way can we identify the past as past, Diane asserts that, quote, the codes and sanctions of slavery always resurface and find new places to inhabit. As is true for Lionel Trujillo's Chimere figure, the body is a kind of historical repository. In what Diane calls the cult of the residue, it is the body that remains, that contains in a sense its history, and that is also a form of prophecy. Throughout the Americas, Diane writes, the concept of personhood could be eliminated for the enslaved who were condemned to live in and through the body. In what she calls the landscape of death, nothing ever dies. Quote, not oppression, nor the, the disfiguring of persons placed outside the pale of human empathy. Haunting continues, she says, and old forms of terror maintain themselves as they find new content. To some extent, creolization tends to be broadly understood as a dialectical process that leads to a synthesis, the product of which is a hybrid creolized being and culture. What the example of the Chimere and of the Creole Dessaline seems to show is that, the hybrid, is that hybridity does not necessarily equate with harmony. On the contrary, hybrid composite being may tear an individual and a community apart, particularly when history, politics, and economics conspire to exacerbate the contradictions that make up the Creole subject and society. Far from a harmonious fusion of their constituent parts, Creole subjects and communities may be fatally riven by contradiction. Terms like creolization, mestizaje, and hybridity allow academics to, in Diane's words, quote, embrace the other to cultivate the magic of the hybrid, to forget the history and politics that such words masked. In the historical example of the Creole de Céline, the shape-shifting chameleon, and in the contemporary case of the Chimère, in many ways the, the living ghosts of Dessaline, one senses that, in contrast to certain utopian ideas of cultural hybridity, creolization is just as likely to have a dystopian, even apocalyptic outcome. 
and must, one must finally ask how it could be otherwise, given the, his, the historical conditions in which Caribbean creolization came into being and the un, ongoing unresolved effects of that history. Thank you. Like everyone else, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers of this event. It's really been a pleasure, and I've learned a lot. Um, the paper that I'm going to read is intentionally a little murky in structure, and I think it will be clear why that is. Um, but I also just had it printed out this morning at the hotel, and when I got here, I realized that their ink was a little low. So if I look, if I look a little like I'm looking through murky water, it might partly be a, an ink problem. <laughs> but if you are having a, a bit of experience of murkiness, that hopefully will be intentional on my part. So um, I wanted to pick up on a few of the themes we've already encountered in some of the papers presented thus far, and. I think you'll recognize that I share with Colin an interest in what it might mean to look at the uncomfortable places where self and other, or in her political analysis, human and inhuman begin to blur. Haiti's often been marked as the limit case, and I'll also be thinking about a couple of instances where it serves that role. I share Martin's interest in a particularly fearful image where he examined the ghostly figures of the chimere. I'll be looking at metaphors of disease. And I share Michael's preoccupation with the cultural forms, musical and choreographic, through which these figures are raised and ultimately worked through. And in fact, if there's time, I already shared Michael, uh, with Michael a little bit of uh, my preoccupation with a particular um, uh, sort of offshoot of this. I'd love to talk a little bit more about another fascinating musical site, I'll mention it at the end of this paper, in which Haiti comes to stand for the dissolution of boundaries between self and other and African American and Haitian identity. So um, this paper's in two sections. It's not moving chronologically. That's part of the point. The first section is called Fluid Bodies. And I'm beginning with a quotation. I'm lying at the bottom of the ocean. Other bodies swim by and eat bits of me. I watch with horror the pieces collapsing, waterlogged. What happened to the blood? Every time I'm touched, I take on another layer of filth, ancient bacteria, hatred. I'm obsessed with washing my body. Even now, I'm taking a vast shower, holding my breath and almost passing out. The next time, I'll use a wide, transparent, yellowed tape to cover my lips. The waterlogged dream, the nightmare of the body coming apart at the bottom of the ocean, permeated and consumed by other bodies, contaminated, obsessed with, re with reasserting some membrane, skin, something to hold oneself in and to hold what one, what, and to hold out what one isn't. The dream is recounted in Ralph Lemon's Geography, Art, Race, Exile, a book documentation of the process of a tripartite seminal work 
in the trajectory of this important African-American postmodern choreographer. The dream is vivid, horrific, and very possibly induced, or at least enhanced, by the larium Lemon was taking to stave off malaria. Larium continues to be the malaria prophylactic of choice for most travelers from the industrialized nation to those including both Haiti and the Ivory Coast where Lemon's dream took place, where, ma where malaria is endemic. This despite the fact that larium's side effects have caused concern among medical practitioners and even more so travelers relying on anecdotal evidence. These side effects range from, quote, vivid dreams to paranoid psychosis. At the time of this writing, Lemon was in Abidjan researching the first section of the project that would become geography, a section entitled Africa Race. Research for Africa Race took Lemon to Haiti as well. In fact, that's where his research commenced. This segment of the trilogy involved, at least as it was conceived, a dialogical exchange of movement vocabularies between an African-American choreographer with, in his own words, a Eurocentric postmodern dance aesthetic and a group of, as he puts it, traditional dancers from West Africa as well as other, another African-American with an urban, these are all his terms, urban movement style. Other collaborators would include black sound artists from Haiti as well as Cuba and the US. Geography was a remarkably honest, risk-taking, telling, and at times disturbing project. The book that documents Lemon's process through the first segment of the trilogy is even more so. I opened with that chaotic dream, not malarial so, so much as, I'm coining this term, lariumol. Uh, sorry a really a submerged, blurry vision of bodily disintegration provoked by a fear of contagion. And yet strangely, grappling with that fear seems to produce a space for thinking about how the very fear of contagion might become a productive force for thinking about the global relationships between black bodies and black arts. My reading won't be an attempt so much to organize or contain these relationships but rather I'll be thinking anti-navigationally through murky waters, flotsam and jetsam, perhaps even disintegrating body parts that litter the works of global artists who have turned to Haiti for both political and aesthetic inspiration. I'll draw your attention to two highly influential African-American choreographers in particular, Ralph Lemon and before him, Catherine Dunham. I said <clears throat> my own course will be, as it were, anti-navigational, and indeed, despite the title of his project, Lemon's geography wasn't interested so much in mapping his identity in relation to his collaborators as in watching it disintegrate. The pieces collapsing, waterlogged. There is doubtless something immensely freeing about non-objective, disintegrative performance. But unmoored identity in seemingly free-floating intercultural collaborations isn't always simply liberating. Lemon's own anxieties about his cross-cultural collaboration with West African as well as Haitian artists was distilled, as our anxieties often are, in a dream. Before re retiring that night in Abidjan, Lemon ate a dish of poulet creole, drank a flag beer, worried over the teeming little insects trying to invade his leftovers, and then I quote, from my bed, I got up and took another larium because of my discipline and without a belief in this season of mosquitoes. Why does the malaria prophylactic inspire less faith, or at least so it seems, than fear? And why does the fear express itself in dreams in which the membrane holding the body intact dissolves, blood disperses in an oceanic flow, and other bodies begin to absorb one's own. Why the panic desire for hygiene, skin, transparent tape, hermeticism, self-containment? Throughout geography, the book, Lemon ponders malaria, which may or may not be causing the fevers and wasting of one of his dancer collaborators. This, not in Abidjan, but in New Haven, in Brooklyn, in Durham, North Carolina. While malaria isn't, of course, endemic in these sites, 
It isn't implausible that the parasite could be causing these symptoms, as a person can harbor the disease undetected for months. But even another of the dancers, who's lived for years in Brooklyn, I quote from Lemon, assumes, being African, malaria is part of his inheritance. Later, yet another diagnosis is made, a case of what they once termed euphemistically a social disease, acquired by one of the dancers during the run in New Haven. Antibiotics treat the infection, but still an undiagnosed, unnamed condition remains. Watching his feverish dancer struggle through chills, sweats, and painful spasms, Lemon reflects, if he were American, I would think he had some disease. But the way his eyes do not focus, and because he's so skinny, I think this because his magic has turned my seeing backward. And anyway, there's very little that I understand about being African. That's the end of the <clears throat> quotation. And yet that is the point, ostensibly, of the piece, the premise of the collaboration, to find a dialogical space through performance to understand across diasporic identities. Maybe the anxiety of the body whose limits have disintegrated is more about that permeability, the, the acknowledgement of how much a North American might understand about Haiti and West Africa through performance than it is about malaria. This is another citation, lengthy. Curled in the black hold of the ship, he wonders why his life on solid green earth had to end, why the gods had chosen this new habitation for him, floating, chained to other captives, no air, no light, the wooden walls shuddering, battered, as if some madman is determined to destroy even this last pitiful refuge where he skids in foul puddles of waste, bumping other bodies, skinning himself on splintery beams and planks, always moving, shaken and spilled like palm nuts in the diviner's fist, and a shoe casts his fate, constant motion, tethered to an iron ring. In the darkness, he can't see her, barely feels her light touch on his fevered skin. Sweat thick as oil, but she doesn't mind, straddles him, settles down to do her work. She enters him and draws his blood up into her belly. When she's full, she pauses, dreamy, heavy. He could kill her then, she wouldn't care, but he doesn't. Listens to the whine of her wings lifting till the whimper is lost in the roar and crash of waves, creaking wood, prisoners groaning. If she returns tomorrow and carries away another drop of him, and the next day, and the next, a drop each day, enough days, he'll be gone, shrink to nothing, slip out of this iron noose, and disappear. <clears throat> that was a passage from John Edgar Weinman's stunning story, Fever, which is about an 18th century epidemic of yellow fever in Philadelphia, carried through the vector of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Weidman recounts the epidemiological rumor circulating at the time that the fever had come from Frenchmen fleeing the Haitian Revolution with their infectious African slaves. Epidemia in the story provokes spreadings of other kinds. Then I quote again, membranes that preserved the integrity of substances and shapes, kept each in its proper, proper place, were worn thin. What should be separated was running together. What should be separated was running together, which means that even political identities could be disintegrating, one's notion of what makes one what one is. Weidman's dreamlike passage recounting the horror of the Middle Passage, the oceanic voyage in which Africans became Americans, resonates uncannily with Ralph Lemon's dream. Ralph Lemon wrote geography, Africa, Ralph Lemon wrote, I'm quoting, Geography, Africa, was in part a performance, but it was equally an anthropological collaboration about being American, African, brown, black, blue-black, male, and artist. Intercultural performance is inevitably about the cross-cultural pedagogical exchange, and so teaches us not only about particular cultures in question, but also about pedagogy itself. 
And interestingly, in anthropological literature, pedagogy is often linked to, to notions of contagion or infection. Think of the famous passage in Claude Lévi-Strauss's Tristropique, called The Writing Lesson. I won't rehearse the scene for you in detail as it's been done so many times before, notably in Derrida's of Grammatology, but I want to remind you that after the, quote, non-literate Nambiquara chief turns the pedagogical tables on Lévi-Strauss by teaching him the lesson of the violence of the letter, there's a weird and anxious denouement in which Lévi-Strauss's wife must be evacuated because she's contracted from the locals an eye infection, I quote, gonorrheal in origin, another social disease. The excessive, almost obscene intimacy implied in ethnographic observation, in which one sees oneself and one's own violence played back across a cultural divide, seems to manifest itself in the pathology of the anthropological gaze. And I believe that this may be what's behind Lemon's disconcerting comment that his dancer collaborators, quote, magic has turned my seeing backward. I quote again, if I were American, if he were American, I would think that he had some disease. But what does the pathology of the anthropological gaze mean? But does the, the pathology of the anthropological gaze mean one should look away? What would it mean to accept the figure to deal with the anxiety and the dis-ease of intercultural work, even as we force ourselves to examine the history and the significance of the anxiety over cultural contagion. The notion of the fluid body or of bodily fluids that disturb a fixed notion of identity can be a productive model for ethically and politically engaged intercultural work and performance, though it demands a certain degree of historical self-consciousness in regard to the figure. And here, speaking of self-consciousness, I feel compelled to make something of an apology because when I speak of the history of the figure of culture as contagion, and specifically African diasporic culture, and particularly African diasporic culture which passes through Haiti, I find myself repeating myself, returning to an argument I've been making for some time now. As I say parenthetically, I was a little, I was honored, flattered to receive this invitation uh, in, and which was made in reference to my book, Infectious Rhythm, which I published quite a long time ago. And uh, I'm compelled to uh, repeat that argument now, although I've been doing it for some time now, uh, partly because of the strange fate of that book. And as I said, I was honored and flattered to receive the invitation on, on account of it. But uh, it's funny because uh, I used to, for a while, I used the metaphor for that book of a message in a bottle, which is to say that when the book came out, it almost immediately seemed, to me, from my perspective, to disappear. Uh, part of the problem, I was speaking with some of you at lunch yesterday about that, part of the problem seemed to be precisely where to locate it. Uh, neither ethnomusicology, dance ethnography, nor epidemiology uh, it couldn't really be mapped out methodologically by any bookstore rubric, nor area studies, really, because it was broadly about the African diaspora, but sometimes situated itself. So it couldn't really go in a, it wasn't really Caribbean studies, it wasn't really African studies, it wasn't really you know, any particular methodological, um, it, it had no real orientation in either of those respects. So I thought of it as a mes message in a bottle, something cast out there that some hapless stranded reader on a desert isle might accidentally locate. Though when I read again that dream passage from Lemon's own text, I realized that was, really, that was really the more fitting image of my own experience of the dissolution, dissolution of my ideas from the page to what seemed to me apparent oblivion, uh, which is why I'm compelled to keep repeating the figure with apologies to any of those, those of you who, uh, who have encountered before my pathological preoccupations. The metaphor of culture as a contagious or infectious disease passing through bodily fluids or fluid bodies has a lengthy and complex history. I map it through that book, really. Um, often the figure takes the, seeming, the seemingly benign form of infectious rhythm, that's the phrase, right? the dispersal of joy, the spread of vitality associated with African diasporic music and dance. Artists and performers in the diaspora frequently invoke this metaphor themselves 
as in the case of Ishmael Reed's brilliant Mumbo Jumbo, which depicts a religious and secular, which depicts religious and secular African American expressive culture as a life-giving plague. So often the metaphor is recuperated by, by artists as a, as a sort of a, a counter plague, a plague that spreads life and vitality. But the figure of cultural contagion can also lead to hostile, even violent reactions to culture. And curiously, people are all too often inclined to literalize the metaphor, to seek out connections between cultural practices and the literal spread of disease. Epidemiological hypotheses of yellow fever's origins in Haiti came at the same time as the violent repression of the drumming and dancing of former Haitian slaves transported to the US. The confluence of a migrational flow precipitated by the Haitian Revolution and the yellow fever epidemic resulted in an intense anxiety over cultural flows and in cultural repression. In retrospect, it seems all too clear that the underlying anxiety on the part of, Af of European Americans was a fear of yet another kind of contagion, the spread of insurgency among African Americans. Similar anxieties were expressed during the US Marine occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934, along with the proliferation of sensationalistic and in retrospect clearly racist accounts of voodoo. The popular press was filled with references to infectious diseases, including yellow fever, malaria, and syphilis. Part of the efforts of the US Marines to establish, quote, hygienic regimens in Haiti included the prohibition of performance practices, music and dance, understood by the authorities to represent both a risk of cultural and epidemiological contamination. Of course, no one articulated the question of political contamination. Surely you will have anticipated the next part of the story. HIV emerged as a pathogen simultaneously with yet another period of intensified cultural exchange. And while it may seem clear that one pandemic is painfully literal, the other figurative, they were quickly associated with one another. In 1996, in Haiti, before he had formally embarked on putting together the project of geography, but at a moment when he began to find himself, in his words, inventing Africa, this is an impulse that came to him during his uh, period of research in Haiti, Ralph Lemon took the following notes. These are from his journal. <clears throat> Looking at the moist skin of these blacks, I need to comprehend some layer of waterless grime, I think, because there's so much poverty here, but it's only sweat, and ultimately, my disease. How is their sweat his disease? How does the fluid passing out of an, another's body evoke the sense of one's own identity? And does that pathological identification in any way mitigate or redeem the desire to other, to anthropologize, to contain, hygienically control, appropriate, choreograph, understand? Could it be that the epidemic model for thinking about cultural transmission and exchange might actually help us to have a fuller sense of the fluidity of identity and identification that performance makes possible? The next section is called What Talcum Won't Cover. In 1936, the African-American choreographer and anthropologist Catherine Dunham was granted a Rosenwald Fellowship to study, quote, primitive dance and ritual in the West Indies and Brazil. Her first stop, Haiti. Her encounters there would change not only her artistic trajectory, but her personal and political lives as well. She bought a property on the island and would dedicate much of the rest of her life to publicizing both the magnificence of Haitian culture and also the political indignities suffered by the nation's people. Her entry into Haiti, however, wasn't so auspicious, and it has uncanny resonances with Ralph Lemons. Dunham was arriving, of course, on the heels of the US occupation, and despite her race, her nationality raised some hackles. In Island Possessed, the book she published some 30 years after, uh, later, documenting her initial experiences in Haiti, Dunham recalls vividly the lush palm grove by the Bay of Entry, and quote, the truly painful beauty of which sheltered ordure, yaws, skin syphilis, infested parents and babies, end quote. In fact, the specter of disease is on the face of the Coast Guard official who examines her documents. 
The possibility of her entry into Haiti is determined by the seemingly mythic figure, I quote, a seedy, almost mulatto type who would be a griffon with spots on his face, artlessly covered by talcum powder. The on, these, this only accentuated the spots which were so placed and of such a texture as to have been unmistakably yaws. That much I knew, but I tried not to disclose the fact that I was, that I was aware, aware of or had heard of this particularly Caribbean skin disorder. I had no reason to be ill at ease, but I knew that if I were to have trouble, this particular petty officer would be the one to cause it, and joyfully. Condescending, resentful, suspicious, sadistic. He took minutes to settle in a chair at one of the dining saloon tables, minutes to adjust his pince nez glasses, minutes to dawdle through the passport of a perspiring student of dance and anthropology wondering what to do next. Then, obviously, just to be confusing, he began speaking in French. I hadn't expected to be called on to use French without thinking it over first and was so taken by surprise that I answered in kind, imperfect though it must have been, without thinking. I have some gods who come rushing in at unexpected moments for big things, but mostly for niggling little things like this. Everything changed. My interrogator managed to smile, not too wide because of his sores, replaced my letters in their folders, held out his hand in farewell as he rose to leave, and pressed mine harder than was necessary. Removing his pince-nez, he looked deeply into my eyes and hoped to see me, uh, uh, he looked deeply into my eyes and hoped to see me in town at the immigration office for further formalities within a day or two. At the same time, if it were toward evening, he could show me something of the scenery surrounding the capital. I made a mental note never to be without hygienic handshaking protection when on foreign territory. In my purse at this moment, there's a bottle of slightly scented surgical alcohol for rinsing after long handshaking sessions, which I've become so accustomed to as a precautionary measure that it is always with me. That's the end. Mm -mm -mm. Not my end, her end. <laughs> more, more. <laughs> I, I don't leave you with the, with the uh, hand sanitizer. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you what that means now, because <laughs> it's peculiar. Although Dunham's uh, telling of the story of her entry into Haiti seems to indicate a similar discomfort to that of Ralph Lemon, she also identified profoundly with the nation's people and ultimately dedicated much of her life to exposing the repeated acts of inhumanity waged against them. In 1992, at the age of 82, she began a hunger strike which she maintained for 47 days and from which she only desisted at the impassioned urging of the then recently ousted Haitian president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. The hunger strike was in protest of the discriminatory immigration policies regarding Haitian refugees. But this was hardly the first time Dunham had tried to wear, uh, raise awareness regarding Haitians' political and health-related issues. She converted her property at the Habitation Leclerc, once presided over by Napoleon's sister, Pauline. Actually, we were having a little conversation about <laughs> various transformations of the Habitation, Habitation Leclerc, which we can talk about later if you want, into a clinic. She had, Dunham turned it into a clinic, a health clinic, and her lifelong work integrating Haitian dance technique into a modern dance vocabulary was always intertwined with her concern for both the political and physical welfare of the Haitian people. But it's interesting how much of her memoir, like Lemons, is preoccupied with the permeability of bodies, with anxiety over contagion and contamination even as the very idea of body's interpenetrability and spiritual penetrability seems to fascinate and inspire her both aesthetically and politically. Visceral descriptions of her Vaudun initiation ceremonies detail the smells and sensations of bodies pressed up against one another, the scent of commingled sweat, the sensation of another woman's hot urine hitting her thighs as they lay pressed together on the floor of the Unfort, smell of snake, viscous mouthful of raw egg, granular sensation of cornmeal rubbing against her skin, all of these, as well as the selfless sensation of her dancing body moving in concert with others, take Dunham to a place that she never quite, quite feels justified in calling, in calling one of religious transcendence, but one that certainly was part of the process of her coming to terms with her political identification with the people of Haiti. 
I'm stirring the waters of these two stories because I think they tell us something important about the ways that Haiti has worked and continues to work in the imaginary of artists in the rest of the African diaspora and perhaps most significantly among African American choreographers. While it's important to attest to cases of clearly racist and xenophobic accounts of Haiti in, in which the historical fear of contagiousness of, in, of the, the contagiousness of insurrection was translated into both epidemiological narratives and figures of cultural infectiousness, it's equally telling to look at the work of artists sympathetic to both Haitian political history and cultural manifestations. The fact that Dunham and Lemon express anxiety around a, a notion of Haitian infectiousness isn't simply evidence of their own susceptibility to virulent racist narratives. They each ultimately recognize the diseases they fear in a sense as their own disease, the pathologizing gaze of anthropology in which the eye can see only its own infection. Lemon and Dunham both had to confront that they weren't immune to an, other, an othering gaze in which they themselves were implicated. But working through that recognition brought them both to a place for honest collaboration, another and perhaps the most hopeful way for the membranes of individual, national, and cultural identity to begin to collapse. And in closing, I guess also looking forward to uh, the conversation between the three of us, I just wanted to mention one other site for thinking about the ways in which African American artists have confronted their own complicity in the configurations of Haitians as infectious and the ways in which they explored that very figure in order to make both political and aesthetic connections with Haiti. Um, and I raise it because I think it's a, an interesting companion story to uh, the story that Michael told us today. Uh, in 1898, U.S. Congress declared war on Spain and formalized what would come to be called the Spanish-American War. At the, at the time, an insidious medical theory existed holding that African Americans were more resistant to the tropical diseases that would be encountered in the Caribbean and so were, and so were established in the so-called immune regiments. Some of you may be familiar with this. African American military regiments that ostensibly had at least an epidemiological advantage. Of course, their immunity was fictitious. A number of them did succumb to malaria, yellow fever, and cholera. We can talk about cholera later, if you like. Uh, but maybe more interestingly, they seem to pick up some other interesting things there. A reputation for insubordination and what would come to be termed, quote, the Latin tinge. Many of the members of the immunes came from New Orleans and unsurprisingly, they were also steeped in music. The Immunes had, at the time, a military band also called the Immunes. It's a great band name, if anybody's looking for a band name. Uh, the Immunes, of extraordinary talent. The polyrhythmic, syncopated lines they'd bring back home went on to profoundly impact the music often referred to as America's classical music, incipient jazz. I don't have time now to expand, although I'd love to <laughs> speak more with, with, with Michael and others of you who have an interest in this. Um, to expand on why it's of interest that military, epidemiological, and cultural contact made for such significant exchanges, simultaneously virulent and salubrious, frightening and exciting, malignant and benign. It was neither the first time nor the last. The question for us is surely not how can we avoid or encourage political, aesthetic, and biological contagion between Haiti, African America, and the rest of the diaspora, but how can we most productively learn to understand its implications? Now that's really the end. <laughs>
the um, Shimea gang members describing themselves as forced into violence to achieve peace. Mm. And might we draw parallels with the historical Dessaline um, in that respect? And if the, uh, the gang members um, uh, sort of, if what they extract from Dessaline is a kind of an apocalyptic, violent politics, if you like, um, how might we compare that with um, what Dessaline meant to say, Oxy Jonti, um, and the kind of black agency that Dessaline represented to Oxy Jonti, again, and in contradistinction to the politics of Tucson? Um, if that's. Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing I would say was that the, um, you don't get a sense in, in those films and you know, anything else that, 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 that I, I've come across that the, the Chimera themselves you know, really would relate themselves to, to Dessaline. You know, I, I don't, you know, I haven't heard that. Um, but, um, but I think that that's kind of my interpretation of it, and it, it leads from the, the, the idea from, from Jensen of the, the Creole Dessaline as, you know, again, my interpretation of that as, as someone um, riven by contradictions, um, uh, almost pulled apart by contradictory forces. Um, so that's, but I think you do certainly get a sense in the, the novel, the, the piece on Tenere, and, and I think it's, it's interesting as well, my interpretation of that, that those two figures, the Lucia and the, the little Joe, the Chimere figure, is that there's, there's some kind of echo there of the, the, the Toussaint Dessaline you know, relationship. It's not quite a duality, because I think the novel is, is quite clever in the way that it blurs that, that uh, distinction between them, and it... You know, even as it's, it presents the, the Chimere figure, the, the Dessalinian figure, as you know, unregenerate and you know, um, violent and um, uh, almost um, bereft of, of any ethical um, consideration, uh, just as it does that, you know, at the same time, it, it's, it, un it undermines the, the, um, the, the opposite figure, the, the, the student figure that they, who opts for, for peaceful protest and is, is a kind of echo of... Uh, Tucson, or, or, but of course Tucson was not um, peaceful um, entirely. So I, I think it's the, the interesting thing is that in the novel especially that that uh, distinction is, is even more blurred and that the, um, it calls into question the, or the, the worth of, of violence and the worth of intellectual endeavor, you know, which, which is the, um, which is the, Correct and most useful path to, to take to, um, you know, for for survival in this case, and but also for um, any kind of social improvement. I think uh, you know one of the things that uh, I, I like the question because it, it pits two very different uh, ways of, of thinking about this alien, and even even if the you know the. the Subjects that uh, Martin's talking about aren't, aren't directly engaging that. I think it uh, it speaks to kind of the power of Dessalines as a, uh, as, a uh, as an inspirational figure, uh, both in pessimistically and optimistically. I think Gentil chose a more optimistic kind of interpretation of that. But I think it's the uh, in in many ways when I was referring to this idea of point or point uh, that uh, it, the way I'd like to think about that is uh, less. Uh, it, it's both a performance of something, an enactment uh, of an idea, but it's also a, a, an interpretation at the same time, so that, so that uh, a figure like Dessalines uh, becomes infinitely interpretable. Uh, that is, he is a, uh, it's, it's possible to, uh, you know, some might say project onto him, but I think it's actually more of a kind of uh, engaging him in ways, uh, you know, specifically rhetorical ways and, and musical ways, I, I think work too. Uh, as this this idea of, of something that can be interpreted, and and it's it's actually the interpretive aspect of Poin that I think is is probably more applicable here. That uh, it's not so much uh, to connect with uh, an authentic image of Dessalines, but rather to acknowledge, as as Voodoo practice does so beautifully, uh, that uh, that all interpretations are multiple, and, and that uh, especially when you talk to to Haitian audiences about. Uh, any kind of musical performance. So there are very few pieces that, 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 that don't lend themselves to interpretation. And in fact, it's, it's the multiplicity of meanings that make a piece engaging and worthwhile. And in fact, uh, if, it's, if it's not contradictory uh, in some ways, that means that it's actually less potent. 
I think, for a lot of audiences. So, I mean, I, I think that's why I, I like juxtaposing these two very different uh, views of, of how the past might uh, be used to uh, inspire, uh, you know, uh, different connections to, to Haitian identity. But, uh, um, but I don't. I, I see them uh, uh, really. Uh, I, I think that that um, uh, the differences in, in interpretation are what, in fact, make it a compelling idea. I think one of the, the other um, differences might be that, um, going by what you say, Michael, the, the John T seem to be using Dessalines as a, or, or myth in a positive way, you know, as, as a, um, you know, as, as uh, some kind of, um, well, as a way of um, inspiring Haiti in the present. But um, I think in most of the most contemporary literature, Certainly, you find um, authors work against myth. You know, what they, they, it's almost a, like there, there's an endless attempt to to pull these myths apart. You know, I, I think I quoted uh, uh, Gary Victor. He, he's talking about 1804, and he says that it, it only um, benefited the the property classes, and the, the rest of the people remain slaves. Um, so that seems to, to would contradict possibly the you know the the glorification of 1804 in the song, and you find that, you know, you, you, it's, it's interesting when you talked about the pace on Chapeau as well, it, it, of course it's the title of the um, Daniel Ferrier novel, and I think in that as well he, he works in, in a very playful way against that kind of nationalistic, you know, indigenous inspired um, myth of Haiti and its history, you know, and, the, and it, I think they do that. It's because of uh, the effects of Duvalierism, really, and the Noirism, yeah. and um, you know, and clearly, John T. precedes uh, <coughs> all of that. But you know, it's, I think that that's an interesting distinction. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, you know clearly the the interpretation of Jean T. And, and and keep in mind too that uh, what I was talking about today is not uh, from the mouth of Jean T. It's <coughs> right; these are interpretations mm. uh, of him by. By members of the Haitian elite, uh, mm -hmm. so so again, yes, it, it certainly does kind of reinforce this idea of uh, uh, one particular group's vision of what's going on, mm -hmm. in contrast with uh, with a very different vision that people mm -hmm. out of power, uh, you know, would have. Uh, at the same time, I, I think I still think that there is uh, there's something to be said for the fact that uh, we're still talking about myth, and and this is this is kind of the uh, this is the discourse that allows us to be able to uh, you know talk about the relationships between these uh, these kinds of conflicts that have been going on in Haiti. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm not ready to, to throw it out yet, but I, I think uh, I think the idea uh, is that uh, uh, there just there's so many ways that this is this is part of the way of talking about it, whether for hopeful means in the case of you know an elite like Shanti mm -hmm. or uh, you know in the case of uh, folks who are really uh, uh, critiquing uh, notions of power uh, in Haiti, uh, you know, in, in other genres. It made me think as well that. Um I don't have the title of it. It's a short story by Jacques Rouman. I, I wrote about it briefly. Um, it's in the, the oeuvre complete. And, and it's set in, in a salon. And in the background, there's actually a recording of the 1804 plane. But it's, I think yeah. the, the, the idea is that the, even in Rouman, you get the idea that the record's worn <coughs> out. You know, by implication, there's something about the history or the, mm. the way that history is being transmitted that's worn out and has lost some kind of um, mm. um, relevance in, in the present. So um, I can give you that reference, but I, I don't, just don't have it at the moment, yeah. Mm. To, to bring Barbara into um, this conversation on Dessaline, one of the things I thought of when you were talking about the spectre of disease and how um, disease has kind of um, been one of the ways in which imperial denigration about Haiti has 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 spread and has, um, uh, and the fear of insurgency um, that the Haitian Revolution promoted, and also the idea that Dessaline is this kind of this unregenerate, brutish, illiterate, kind of barbarous character. That seems to have also sp spread like spread. a disease. Mm. Um, and so lots of the things you're saying in your paper made kind of, I was making connections with lots of things, but one of them was with Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom, which to me mm. um, is kind of completely haunted by this mm. idea um, of, um, of black insurgency mm. as, um, as like a, a medical kind of, okay. uh, as a sort of, a disease that's incubating and preparing to kind of rise up and, and destroy slaveholding 
the slaveholding American self. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was thinking about the kind of the multiple um, sort of powers that that right. image has. And I was wondering if you might speak a little bit more about that. Um, so sure, I'm, I'm super prepared right now to talk about Faulkner. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, just it's, no, no, super, super provocative. <laughs> no, but, but I think the, um, just to sort of pursue this line of, of uh, insurgency or insubordination is something that's contagious and the ways that that gets literalized. Um, this is just my own mind kind of uh, making strange connections, but I'm also just thinking about some of the other things that we've talked about earlier, like yesterday in, in when Colin was speaking about, I think mentioned, um, you know, this, and a question that seems to keep coming back, which is this question of why it is that popular histories in Haiti are so interesting, and, and partly it's got to do with something you were mentioning about Dessaline, which is um, the ways in which they're always multivalent, that is to say, not, never, and, and that's got something to do, I guess, with Vodun cosmology, one could say that, uh, that this notion, it's that the law, generally speaking, are not positive or negative, good or bad, you know, good or evil, but that there's this polyvalency that allows for multiple readings or multiple meanings that you mentioned, and, and it's interesting that you go to a place where you're, you're uh, elic eliciting multiple interpretations of a particular, and, and so this made me think also, uh, and so this question of popular histories which are not accurate, <laughs> but are really accurate and are really interesting in, in the ways that they're layered and have multiple meanings, and, and um, Colin had mentioned briefly something about Paul Farmer's work, and one of the things that I think is interesting about the ways that he has narrated Haitian history and also listened to popular narratives of Haitian history is related to his work in medical anthropology because medic he studied with Arthur Kleinman, who's probably the, you know, just sort of leading figure in medical anthropology who has encouraged people to take seriously medical narratives that are produced by People, but people who are experiencing disease, which often are not medically correct <laughs> in the same way, or epidemiologically correct in the same way that you know some of these popular narratives of Haitian history are not historically accurate, and yet tell you something interesting. So he, you know, for example, he he's working with a patient, a woman who's who, who has AIDS, and she says in Haiti, and she says, um, I think I got it. She's a domestic servant, and she says, I think the reason I have AIDS is from opening and closing the refrigerator door, you know, that the cold draft, for, that this has caused AIDS. So, you know, on the one hand you say, well, no, there's a pathogen and it's HIV and it was transmitted this way. But what she's telling Paul Farmer when she says that is that there's something about her domestic labor, that is to say her, her precarious position as a woman basically living under conditions where she couldn't support herself through this labor and put, had to put herself in precarious sexual relationships in order to survive. <laughs> Therefore, there's a certain accuracy to that narrative that ends up being pretty, like the real, the real pathogen was not HIV. The pathogen was, her, was the social structure within which she was put into this precarious position. So actually, that if you go through those layers of narrative, there's something really that profoundly important that she's telling you when she says it's got to do with opening and closing the refrigerator door. So, now how did I get to that? Oh, the relationship really between epidemiological or, or medical narratives and popular histories, which I think in Haiti are, have a particular density, you know, and once again, to go back to this question of whether or not that has to do with a cosmological openness to multiple meanings, or if it has to do with um, something that we've talked about earlier, which has to do with a sort of layered, a, a layered sense of history, a sense that, that manifests itself also in the musical and dance choreographic forms in Haiti. That is to say, polyrhythmic music is all about understanding multiple timelines happening at once, which is, as I, I think, a lot to do with a sort of general Haitian sense of of, of a layered history that one is always aware of. So that was a convoluted, but I guess I'm, I'm working on con convolutedness today. <laughs> I thought, Barbara, when you, it was interesting, something came to mind when you talked about yaws. Yaws. Yaws, right? yeah. yeah. In Haiti, wasn't it? Yeah. When you're talking about uh, Catherine Dunham and yeah. her, the, the presence and the, 
the visibility of that uh, disease. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what yours is. What is it? Well, she, she describes it as skin syphilis. Right. Um, and, yeah. yeah, so... Well, my, my point was that um, Francois Duvalier, you know, wasn't he, um, wasn't that one of his um, medical priorities or his missions to... to yeah. So it, it made me think as well if you could, you know, extend that, that idea of... Um, Disease, infectious disease, and you know, consider Duvalier. You know, um, what was his, um, you know, his relationship with the Haitian people? You know, and uh, as as a father, you know, administering a cure, you know, right. and, and a purifying and. Um, a doc. Yeah. Well. Well. <laughs> yes. Well. Exactly. Yeah. You know. That, that. That's. That's the point. That yeah. you know. That extending that that idea of of him as a, as a kind of, um, you know, as someone concerned with with. The, with disease right. and, you know, politically, you know, administering other kinds of, of, of cures, you know, so that, that's just what it came to mind. Sure. Mm. Yeah, well, oftentimes uh, there's a direct link or sometimes indirect link between certain kinds of social control that are ostensibly hygienic in mm. nature. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe just to add to that, uh, you know, certainly, you know, uh, Duvalier known as a, as a medical doctor, right. but also uh, clearly someone who is very steeped in understanding about Haitian folklore and his role with the uh, uh, Bureau of Ethnology. And also something else that uh, I just have to point out because I, I teach at Michigan State University, which is one of two large universities in Michigan, and our rival is the uh, University of Michigan, and that's where uh, Francois Duvalier received a uh, Master's of Public Health, uh, which uh, delights my students no end uh, whenever I bring that up. Uh, so, so in fact, he he also had an awareness of epidemiology. Of health, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we should now open it up to <coughs> questions from the floor, if we if we may. Yeah. I think there's a microphone that can be passed around. Um, hi, and thanks everybody for fantastic, inspiring talks. Um, I just want to try and formulate a question based on yesterday's presentations and discussions that were had last night and various discussions. And to start it, I just want to go to Habitat Jean Leclerc and the history of um, disease in Habitat Jean Leclerc. Uh, just anecdotal stories yeah. that, firstly, about um, General Leclerc's troops being taken out largely by yellow fever, which was understood to be, by voodooists, Macandal. Uh, so I'm trying to just pick up on that right. story. I don't know what the truth is to that, but there is that legend. The second one is that um, Appetition Leclerc became a hotel, decadent hotel, in I think the 1960s and 70s. And associations with, uh, there are stories about HIV and this, this um, sexual relations that tourists were having and of course the ones HIV as you well know became associated with Haiti tourism stops as a so there's that story and so those are just two stories about Abitash on the Clerk and right. the question of disease um, but what I'm really trying to get to is that um, there's an article written recently by an author called Frank de Gaulle on called um, we are the mirror of your fears uh, and what it deals with is um, uh, endogenous reappropriations of negative stereotypes of voodoo from exogenous representations mm -hmm. as strategies uh, and what has been described as a witchcraft arsenal. And what I'm trying to get to is because of the, this idea that, the thing, that, the, that you talk about very well, that, that all these kind of po these, uh, polarities are reversible within, within, let's say, voodoo cosmology, that is there a kind of, and I think we may need to talk about, a voodoo stratagem. Uh, which would be both challenging the kind of epistemes that we may be ordinarily operating outside of Haiti. It is so, uh, so, is there a question here? Um, it's to do with whether or not you, anybody considers that there is a kind of epistemic voodoo stratagem that we might be able to utilize to facilitate and, 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 and aid uh, uh, voodooists in Haiti right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a, yeah, I, I mean, I just, obviously I'm kind of joking. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that's right. I think that, 
what, what I was looking at today, because in Infectious Rhythm, I talk about a number of artists, but some Haitian and other artists in the African diaspora who, who take up these negative, uh, sort of negative configurations of, of disease and, and turn them into something positive. And usual, oftentimes it's, it's something, you know, you look at Marvin Gaye or something like sexual healing. You know, there, there's a ton of stories, uh, songs, paintings, uh, narratives, and I mentioned Ishmael Reed, where it's, it's just an obvious reversal. You talk about the sort of spreading of joy and spreading of vitality, and it's something that can be contagious. That's, that's, that's one. But what interests me about the two figures I was talking about today is that they're actually completely ambivalent. I mean, that's real fear, and it's real dis-ease around these, you know, and, and even to, they literalize it. You know, like he's taking larium, she's putting hand sanitizer on. They're, they're freaking out. And they're not, but they're, you know, it's not, they're, they're people who have profound desire to identify with, with the Haitian people, both politically and aesthetically. And they understand, even as they're having this kind of freak out, they understand where it's coming from and they, they're, but they're, they're acknowledging that. And that's, to me, one of the interesting, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, there are these other cases where it's kind of funny or it seems like a clever strategy to flip it upside down. And, <coughs> but this is, this is, I think, that's why I think that they're very honest. I mean, they're very honest in dealing with their own ambivalence about this and their desire to, to break through it. So it's, um, th that's one of the reasons that I, I kind of wanted to think further about them because that's, that's the complicated thing. But whether or not that's, you would call that a cos uh, sort of a, an episode whether it's a, it's a political strategy that comes out of Vaudun, I, I think that I'm, I'm tempted to say that indeed that that's part of what's um, what's interesting to them, or to Dunham at least, certainly about Vaudun cosmology is that it is that complicated, that nothing is ever going to be simple. Um, so I would, yeah. I might add to that too, um, just uh, in reference to something that uh, Colin brought up uh, yesterday, the. Uh, uh, the swine flu uh, epidemic uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, USAID and, and other uh, and other groups came in to uh, eradicate Creole pigs. Uh, I, I was living in Haiti uh, during much of that period, and uh, the, uh, the the work that I talked about this morning uh, is is not really what I'm working on now. This is sort of you know from something uh, previously published. But uh, what I'm what I'm working on now is uh, I look at the Haitian Raga. Uh, the Lenten processional uh, performance where, uh, you know, music, dance, uh, and, and various other kinds of performance are done uh, during, uh, during the Lenten period, uh, and it's very much connected with the voodoo practice. It's essentially kind of a mobile voodoo ceremony. It's uh, very active in uh, political protest, militarism. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the songs that uh, a particular band that, uh, that I worked with in uh, Leogan, uh, the, the band is Raratsi uh, Maliskashi, and one of the uh, the songs that they sang, uh, this is right after, uh, right during the, uh, the the period where the U.S. was uh, had an embargo on Haiti while the military junta was in, in power in the early 90s. Um, they uh, they sang a song called uh, "Cochon Creole," uh, which is called "Creole Pig," and the the song, uh, the lyrics are uh, essentially saying, you know, there was a swine flu epidemic. Uh, it also mentions a uh, a disease that was affecting coconut trees that were, were dying in large numbers. And then uh, there's a line in it that says, um, uh, uh, Bon Dieu dirige en lait, Américain dirige à terre. God directs the sky, and the Americans direct things that are on the ground. Uh, and then it goes on to say, Vez au papa, like, you know, watch your back. Uh, you know, if, if you're not careful, the Americans are going to try to, in fact, direct what's in the sky. And what I, what I found, I, I wrote a, an article about this, and, and what I found compelling about that is that it takes a, a local disaster of the coconut tree plantings with a national problem of the Creole pig uh, eradication campaign with the embargo of Haiti uh, by Americans all in one song, all in one verse, actually. Um, so, at, and I, I see that, I, I interpret that as a, as, a point, as, a, as a point which is being made, which is to say that in order to understand any one of these things, you must see them in relationship with each other. And you know, and these are these are mostly people who cut sugar cane who are talking about this. So you know, we're talking about uh, uh, folks who are not, let's say, participating in you know the scholarly discourse, and yet who very pithily uh, can can sandwich these ideas in ways that makes you know local 
national and international aspects be in relationship with each other. It's, it's a brilliant song. And they're, and they're just, you know, there are hundreds of other songs that do that uh, in, in, in even more subtle ways. I have a, <clears throat> thank you for your talks again. Um, I have a quick question uh, for Michael and for uh, Barbara. Uh, Michael, I was just curious about, um, you, you said briefly, you mentioned this, trying to get at, you were looking at more so the interpretations of Jean T. And I was just wondering about, so, Jean T's voice, and was that, is it difficult to, to sort of find uh, sort of his correspondence or letters, and just what's your sense of just um, uh, the reasonings behind sort of what he's trying to do at this particular moment and sort of capturing that voice? And for Barbara, I was just quickly wanted to ask, um, you mentioned sort of the freak out. Now, I wanted to get sort of the context of the freak out a little bit, and if you could provide some of the information about sort of what you know about what Dunham knows or what Lemon knows about um, whether it be a malaria or, because I, I guess I, I may have missed it in your paper, just wondering, what does Dunham know about yaws? What does she know about sort of, uh, sort of epidemiology or the disease or uh, problems, health issues with regards to, to Haiti and what, or what's sort of being, what's circulating at the time period that sort of informs them uh, within the U.S. or things that Herskovitz may have said, or things that age. Um, in, neither, in neither Lemon's case nor in Dunham's case, are they, I mean, it's, it, I would say that they were operating with the same kind of popular knowledge and popular narratives that, that you know, that neither of them were specialists, although she did go on to establish that medical clinic, but never as a, as a herself, a, a particularly knowledgeable, you know, she wasn't trained uh, as a medical practitioner, but so she was really, in both, of, in both of their cases, they were working with kind of popular uh, generalized ideas about risks and, that were not, you know, particularly, they're somewhat realistic, you know, and, and, you know, larium was prescribed for lemon, and, but the degree to which, and he himself, what I, what I think is interesting about Lemon's account is that he himself says, I don't even really believe in this. I'm taking this prophylactic medication just because in some ways I'm, I'm just confronting my own no, knowing that it's an irrational fear in a way. So, and it's not, it's not that it's an irrational fear. I mean, there's, there's reason that he was prescribed larium, but, but he himself is acknowledging that it's, he's partly taking it as a kind of a magical, uh, almost ritual, Thing. Whereas with Dunham, I think it's a, a little bit less clear that she's that she's actually grappling with that in the, in the moment that she's writing about it. But do you want to say? Mm. Just, I don't know how many people have taken larium uh, here, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it has a it, for me. I, I took it uh, briefly and then you know, stopped doing that and just didn't. And I actually, I stopped taking uh, larium not only because it, uh, it gave me uh, strange dreams and actually made me feel quite depressed, but. Uh, in addition, uh, w when I was working in, uh, in Leogan uh, on uh, Rara uh, things, uh, there were often uh, members of the CDC uh, in Leogan because they were working on a, on a project to try to eradicate filariasis, the, uh, the, the parasite that causes elephantiasis, or right. great swelling of the uh, uh, extremities. And uh, none of the people at the CDC take any prophylactics. So, you know, the, the folks who recommend that we, that, that people take this stuff, uh, in fact, we're not yeah. using any of those things at all. So I figured that, that's, that's cool. You know, I, can, <laughs> I can stop doing that because it made me feel terrible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which, which chloroquine had never done, which in fact is still recommended in Haiti, one of the few places where, chlor where chloroquine is uh, still effective. Um, uh, maybe to, to get back to your, your question about uh, Jean-Ti's voice. It's a great question, uh, because it, and it's something that's really uh, kind of uh, vexed me uh, somewhat, because I've, uh, uh, initially I thought that, that was the perspective that I wanted to get. Uh, in some ways, uh, you know, the, the, the report that I'm making today is, is a chronicle, uh, sort of a, uh, you know, it's, it's a failure story, uh, where uh, I'm not able to uh, account for that, although I did inter interview his uh, daughter. Uh, and that was a very interesting uh, uh, afternoon, uh, because the uh, it was clear that, uh, at least in the family, I, I can only really speak for the impression that I got of talking to, to his daughter and, and her cousin, um, that uh, really the, the narrative that is embraced by the family is one 
of um, of resistance and of heroism. That those those two themes come through uh, very quickly. Uh, the other thing, and, and I'm not I'm not quite sure exactly how this how this fits, but uh, uh, that particular interview was was a difficult one because uh, I, I'm uh, you know, I'm a native English speaker, uh, and my uh, most of the field work that I did uh, was conducted in uh, in Creole, and uh, and when I would talk to people, I would say, well, you know, it's it's actually much easier for me to do an inter interview in Creole rather than French, just because I, I don't I don't really speak French. I, I can understand, uh, you know, quite a bit of it, depending on how it's how it's spoken. But the um, and, and I of course read French, but uh, you know I, I don't feel quite as comfortable. So you know, if you wouldn't mind, we could do this. And you know, after after you know many minutes of. Uh, her starting in Creole and then, you know, lapsing into into French. Uh, it was clear that you know the 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 kind of image that I think you know she was interested in me getting was one of someone you know of a particular social standing, uh, of, of a particular status, and uh, and and that came through very clearly not only in the things that she was telling me about Jeanti, but also in the language in which she told me uh, because that actually that, that's the only interview that I have in French, uh, you know, after a year of field work. Um, so, you know, I think the, uh, and another thing about that afternoon is that uh, as, as we were doing the interview, it was actually the anniversary of Jeanti's death that day. Uh, and the music started, I mean, speaking of the, uh, the short story you were, you were mentioning before by uh, Roumain, his music came on in the other room uh, while we were interviewing. So we all went into the room where the radio was and uh, listened to it. And then, you know, the, the family, the entire family is, is in tears listening to this music, essentially enacting this, you know, this, this kind of, you know, this performative display that I'm, that I'm talking about here uh, in, in ways that I, you know, I could not have anticipated, but nevertheless told me a lot about, you know, kind of this, this affective power of the music that was uh, being done. I still don't have an answer to your question. Uh, I wish I did, but, uh, but, it, but certainly I think that's what got me onto this idea that uh, the Jeanti's legacy is something that can be interpreted. And I didn't talk today about how uh, in many of the other uh, sort of narratives about Jeanti, people would use very compelling metaphors uh, likening Jeanti's uh, uh, compositional process uh, to uh, experience of spirit possession, eyes rolling in the back of the head, gesturing to people who aren't there, uh, essentially composing a piece, you know, in his mind, uh, but using all of the physical characteristics of voodoo possession. And these are not people who subscribe to voodoo. Uh, practice. Uh, so I, I just think, again, it's not literally about embracing voodoo or rejecting it, but rather recognizing that that is a kind of common vocabulary that people use to describe something which is uniquely Haitian in, in distinction from American, which was, you know, the, the thing that they were trying to distinguish themselves from at that time. So. Uh, question up at the top. Did you say infectious and contagious? Uh -huh. I just wondered, um, occasionally, I know you have a difference between the two, but occasionally you were using one, you were using yeah. the other legs. Infectious and contagious, yeah. Um, I just wondered if you'd say um, a bit about that, I mean, whether that's an important distinction in the kind of, this is for Barbara, the question. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, yeah, one, obviously, because Dunham was obviously, she was afraid of contagion. You know? uh, she was afraid of the contact, you know, which is implied in contagion. Yeah. Um, what, to what extent is that distinction between infection in general and contagion in particular important for you? Um, yeah, I, 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 in this case, I wasn't really um, making a tremendous distinction between the two, partly because in terms of the, the ways that the language get u gets used in popular accounts of cultural sp culture spreading, you know, the ways that culture spreads. Um, and I guess contagion is actually the, the more operative term, but infectious is often the term that is used in the popular accounts, that, that precisely the term infectious rhythm. Um, so I wasn't really uh, 
actually the variation was more of a rhetorical uh, desire not to, to be overly redundant with the use of the, of the particular term, but um, I'm interested why your colleague finds this, is it, what, what's the political nuance that he's finding in the distinction between the two terms? I understand what you're saying about the difference between the two, but what, it is, what is it that he finds important to communicate politically? Is, is that the... I can hear you if you shout. But... Yeah, I'll, I'll speak and I'll project. Uh. Um, but the issue with, with really to do with is students being confused about modes of transmission. They, oh, well, that's, a, that's it, precisely interesting because oftentimes, the, yeah. That's well, and that, but that has to do with the, um, okay. Sorry, Exactly, with myths of transmission. Okay, so, well, but here's, here's what's interesting is that on the one hand, I mean, I was going to say particularly with HIV, but that's not the case, actually. It's with any, it's with any epidemiological narrative. On the one hand, you want to be very careful about what you communicate about the actual ways in which disease or, diseases are communicated and what, what vectors actually... And, you know, you want your students, for example, to understand safe sex and, and on a very just basic level, like you need to know this about this is how HIV is transmitted. On the other hand, these ways in which people have mistaken, you know, or incorrect, that's what I was talking about, these narratives, for example, the, the idea, the woman who says, oh, I got HIV from opening and closing the refrigerator door, which is incorrect but interesting. And, and so on, on the one hand, you, you certainly don't want for people to think, oh, you can get HIV from kissing, you know, or you, you don't want to misinform people about modes of transmission. On the other hand, you do want to take into account what's interesting about reading carefully mistaken, you know, incorrect. I was, I'm using all of these, you know, sort of ironic distancing uh, quotation marks. but. But those things are actually interesting to think about what it tells you when people narrate things epidemiologically incorrectly. So, so on the one hand, yes, you know, you need to be very, uh, you need to, you know, particularly when you're, when you're talking sort of about young people who need to understand both historically and also in, they need to understand what risks there are and what they should be, you know, what, what responsible behavior is at the same time you want for them, you want for everyone, for all of us, to really think deeply about what it means when we misrepresent epidemiological processes, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I think someone was... Yeah, I think there were two questions. I think Alex had a question and someone else at the front. Thanks. Um, thank you all. Um, this this, this might, might apply to all of your uh, papers, but again, maybe particularly Barbara, and perhaps linking back to something John said just now, which is that um, the talk of uh, Haiti as a local locus of contagion in the um, foreign, maybe American imaginary, uh, reminded me of the, the social and welfare, and in particular the medical function of voodoo uh, for people that have no recourse to institutions um, in Haiti. And um, I think many would argue that Verdu's primary purpose is healing, yeah. uh, both through medical and, let's say, mythical or right. sacred right. means. And also, which might be overdetermined, people make a distinction between uh, good Verdu priests and mambos that work with the right hand and bokors or sorcerers that um, use the powers of vodou for negative reasons by working with the left hand. Um, as a left hander, I find that kind of Victorian notion a bit <laughs> discriminatory. But anyway, let's, let's go with it. And um, so, and you know, Leah talking yesterday about her insistence of including the tree column and references to plants and so on as sources of healing in her. Um, grid on the Loire Pantheon, what they variously stand for. And on the other hand, you know, thinking of Colin's voodoo history, 
which Michael alluded to, the importance of poisoning as a means of slave revolt. I mean, I suppose the two forms of kind of um, offensive uh, resistance were, were fire on the one hand, the burning of plantations, which was obviously very visible, and ultimately the burning of Capetian, I think by um, Henri Christophe, the kind of latter end of the revolution, kind of scorched earth policy to finally win the revolution. But poison as a kind of invisible and therefore perhaps more threatening form of resistance because it was so hard to identify. Um, and it's this idea that the contagion is invisible, but the symptoms of course are hypervisible. Mm -hmm. But the contagion's invisibility, a bit like the idea of the chimere, mm -hmm. or perhaps the idea that the tonton le coup do their most uh, terrifying work at night, being kind of quite intrinsic to this idea of contagion, this invisibility. And McCandle, I think, was um, executed for poisoning. Um, and executed by fire very visibly, a form of spectacular punishment. Um, let me try and remember where this went. And also someone raised Papa Doc, and of course he was, you know, as he said, both, both a medic and uh, began as a kind of populist politician, had, had much of the vote, I, I think he won democratically, um, and it was for curing yours around the countryside. And he was, you know, his, his, this nickname, Papa Doc, suggests both familiarity and someone respected, like a Papa Ogu, you know, you look up, that's what Papa kind of means, and then Doc also, Doctor. So again, there's the medical and the, um, uh, and the Vodou, and the, the mythical, the supernatural combined. Um, and, you know, of course, he, or he also um, uh, projected an image of himself as Baron Sandy, the, the the Lord of Death, as well as this doctor, if you like, the, uh, you know, the source of healing. So it's kind of conjuring up an image of illness and death, and then presenting the uh, image of himself as the one uniquely able to kind of cure. So um, I'm not sure, how to, again, how to turn this into a question, but it's something to do with something quite inherent in, in voodoo, and perhaps a lot of the history related to it around um, healing and the proximity of the, uh, uh, the medical um, and the sacred, but also this kind of very, um, uh, the, this, the, the tipping point between the uh, uh, um, healing and the contagion, I suppose, the infection, and this thing of uh, the invisibility of contagion and the invisibility being somehow, you know, where the real terror lies. It's at night when you know, people are turned into Hellas pigs and Luc Garou, the werewolves, and, and these, you know, amazing things called Zobops, and again, when the Tonton Maku, the most uh, active. So there's something about day and night, visibility and invisibility, and so on. Um, not a question, but is there something there that people want to pick up on? It sparks all kinds of things for me. I, I feel I'm being, I'm hogging the microphone. <laughs> um, do you want to? Do you have something? But, you know, I'll, I'll try. Uh, yeah, I think the, um, you know, the old saw about, uh, you know, the difference between uh, medicine and poison is dosage. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I think the, uh, you know, certainly to look at uh, how, you know, voodoo uh, kind of embraces or, or, or at least accounts for uh, those differing uh, attitudes towards kind of a, a physical uh, intervention uh, with people affecting their health. Uh, you know, again, like, like I was saying before, like Karen McCarthy Brown says that that's, uh, uh, that doesn't imply a sort of a moral exemplar position, but rather uh, the recognition of the fact that healing happens in social, economic, political, historical, sexual contexts. And one of the things that's most uncomfortable uh, about that, and that, that discomfort was something that I, I really felt, uh, you know, resonating in Colin's talk yesterday, is that uh, when all of those contexts are uh, present and available simultaneously and can be invoked by people who understand what those contexts are that uh, you know as we were talking before uh, I mean it's, it sort of turns this notion of history inside out I mean history in fact is is literally it is oftentimes interpreted as one narrative right that, that there is a story uh, and that in, uh, and then in fact it ignores so many of the other things that are going on and as uh, you know Barbara's example uh, about uh, from from Paul farmer's work where a uh, it's possible to interpret uh, this, uh, this patient's uh, narrative of her illness uh, as essentially contextualizing 
her as a social being at the same time. It's, it's acknowledging that it's, that it's part of this. And it just it reminded me of, uh, again, I'll go back to this, this work I've been doing on uh, Raga, that, uh, and, and especially having to do with filariasis, um, because uh, th this is, uh, uh, you know, it's a very uh, debilitating and, and very obvious disease for people to have. It marks you and it and makes people uh, less so today, but uh, you know, certainly uh, t for people uh, much like leprosy was uh, in, in the past, kind of marks you as a kind of social outsider. And um, the, uh, a, a lot of what, um, you know, when the CDC uh, was trying to make inroads uh, in the area, and, and it's endemic in, in Laogan, and in fact, it has the highest incidence of filariasis in the Western Hemisphere, so, so that's why they have this study going on there. Um, for, um, uh, for a lot of the, the people who were working at the CDC, they were, they, they were treating this as a medical problem uh, for, for many years. You know, simply identifying people who had, who had, the, uh, who were carrying the the microfilaria in their blood, uh, and, uh, uh, and and just trying to treat them, uh, you know, in, as as a medical problem. And uh, and one thing that they were finding was that it, you know it's very difficult to coordinate uh, a a response to this disease because I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but uh, it's even more insidious than malaria is. I mean, it, it uh, uh, these are essentially. Uh, they're essentially worms that uh, enter the body through the bloodstream uh, by the bite of an infected mosquito. Uh, they infiltrate the lymph nodes, and uh, it actually takes a male and a female worm to, they have to mate inside the body, so they find each other in the human body and mate in the lymph nodes, and that's what breaks down the, you know, the immune response, in, uh, you know, usually for, you know, it's in the lower, uh, lower extremities, so uh, when, um, uh, Essentially, the, the damage done to the to the body is the aftermath of the disease. You basically are you don't have the disease anymore, or you may be carrying the microfilaria. But but it's uh, uh, the elephantiasis is simply a, a byproduct of, of the actual uh, infection. And uh, as, as the CDC was was looking at this as a medical problem, they they just were not really having very great success. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that I found was that uh, they were engaging uh, Haitian health workers uh, in Laogan to uh, to let's say. Um, help carry this message of, uh, of, of what they could do for people medically to folks who, who were not uh, available through either you know, radio broadcast or through flyers because you know, many of the people didn't read and write. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the groups that, uh, uh, or, or some of the Haitian health workers that, uh, that I ran into uh, in Laogan had actually organized on their own a program where they would go out and they would actually participate in Haitian Raga performances where uh, there's a patron-client relationship in uh, Raga where uh, people who uh, are uh, in a band will go to a, a, a designated place and will offer, you know, songs and then the, the, the patron will provide gifts uh, in various ways uh, to, to the band. And uh, this, this, these health workers actually erected a Raga reviewing stand in a, in a uh, in a rural area up in the mountains above uh, Leogan in a town called Troin. And they uh, took me up there. It was just kind of a, let's, you know, let's go up and see this on a Saturday afternoon. I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything that, uh, that particular day. And uh, went up, uh, saw the performance of these various bands, which were just spectacular uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this part of the country. And uh, one of the health workers had a bullhorn uh, with him because this, this particular town didn't have electricity. And uh, he was... Um, he was making up new words to the songs that people were singing in the band. So as bands would come to the reviewing stand, this, this health worker would sing different, different uh, lyrics about the importance of getting vaccinated against filariasis. Because if you take uh, ivermectin, you can, you, can have, uh, you can essentially suppress the, the worms within your bloodstream and, then, and thereby uh, reduce the, uh, the likelihood that you're going to pass along the disease to, to your neighbors. And uh, as, as he was singing this song into the, into the bullhorn, um, I could hear people in the band singing it back mm -hmm. as they were going off into the mountains. And you know, I, I was really moved by that I, you know, as a musician and, and just you know, seeing how this, this incredibly great sort of cultural moment where these health workers had realized something that the CDC could never have realized, right. is that you know, Rara was, was the most effective way to get this work in. And I turned around, I looked at him, and uh, you know, when it happened, he had this big smile on his face, and he, and he said, Limache, right, it works, right. Uh, saying that you know, if, if, if we are going to have success, we need to do this in ways which are 
culturally acceptable but also culturally recognizable to people. That in fact, you know, the, the in in this exchange of patron and client in Gaga, it's understood that um, he was giving them something to carry with them, along with the flashlights and condoms and lanterns that they hand out to people uh, as gifts. Uh, uh, they were, he was also handing out, uh, you know, a no some knowledge and. Uh, uh, you know, an awareness of how they might be able to get uh, treatment for this uh, for this disease. Well, also just to state the obvious for those of you who, under, who know about instrumentation and raw music, but the main instrument is vaccin, right? It's, a, the, yeah, it's a, the, vaccine. the metaphor of the yeah, the metaphor of vaccination is, is embedded in the very instrumentation of the music. So yeah, um, just if, a brief footnote also because. Um, uh, in my in infectious rhythm, one of the things that I talk a lot about is um, actually not in Haiti, but in Brazil, African uh, religion, the Candomblé community was really a super major important um, source for getting um, HIV education out. And um, although, of course, there, as in many places, there were a lot of assumptions about because there is ritual scarification, <laughs> and you know, there there can be blood human blood as well as animal sacrifice. So people sometimes freak out about the animal sacrifice, but then also obviously human blood in relation to HIV. But um, there, there's no documented uh, transmission of HIV even prior to the education uh, sort of um, movement within the Candomblé. There was no evidence that there was actual HIV transmission that was going on through any of the ritual practices, but in fact, the Candomblé became a really important place for people to, and they used Candomblé cosmology to talk about HIV education in a very, um, in a in a really smart way, and things like uh, condoms were explained in relation to the the notion in that in the Candomblé is called um, the corpo fechado, the closed body, which is actually a process of scarification, but but it, it's about understanding opening your body to a community and then healing it within that community so it's like a second skin. And then that became a figure for talking about why it's important to use condoms, which was really the, the message that needed to get out, use condoms. And so, but the way that that was integrated into the cosmology really put a spin on, because of course there, were, there was a lot of sort of, from outside of the religion, there was a lot of panic around, oh, they do things with blood, it's gonna have some, you know, they're gonna spread AIDS. So on the contrary, you know, it's a really important AIDS education resource. I mean, um, I'm not contributing much to this part, because uh, and, and, and I've been trying to think of um, images or ideas of healing in relation to Haitian literature, and I don't really think that, I can't really think of any, and nor can I think of any, many instances of um, bodily disease being being presented, which is, I guess, is significant in itself, and I hadn't really thought of it before. Um, I, I guess if what the, um, on the other hand, what Haitian literature that tends to be interested in, in forms of illness, it's um, more on a kind of psychological level or in terms of, of memory or of relation to, to, to the past. So. Um, so yeah, I, ideas of um, yeah or of mental illness or of um, some kind of um, well yeah if you know the the, the novel by Gary Victor along the rue parallèle a, a kind of madman kind of serial killer figure that the kind of um, this this difficulty of um, of differentiating between you know someone who who is mentally well and someone who who is mentally um, unwell. So that, that's part of the, the, the broader interest, I think, in contemporary Haitian writing. But it, it also made me think of um, the absence, relative absence of voodoo in, again, in contemporary Haitian literature. You, you get very few representations of, of the kind that, that, that uh, we've been talking about. Um, and I think that's partly to do with the um, largely urban setting of most most of Haitian or recent and contemporary Haitian literature. But it, it also made me think of two fairly recent works, um, one by Lionel Trujillo, pardon, um, Lionel Trujillo called Yon Valu pour Charlie, and the other by Daniel Ferrière, L'Enigme du Retour. And these, these were works which, which actually do contain scenes of healing. Um, in, in Trujillo's case, there's an, 
uh, narrator who's a kind of cynic, cynical, jaded lawyer figure um, who has come from the countryside to the city, but who has, to do so, he's had to adopt a, a different identity. He's more or less had to um, reject his, his, this, his past, and his, um, his background as a, as a fairly poor um, person from the country. But basically, th uh, what happens in, in the book is that he, this, this guy, Charlie, comes from, comes from his past to, to visit him in the present in, um, in the city. And Charlie dies, and the, the narrator actually undertakes this journey back to the countryside, back to the, the place that he'd come from, back to all the memories and so on that he had to repress um, to be successful in the city. And there are really quite... Um, quite striking scenes of healing. And it's, it's interesting as well, it's, it's healing. The Yonvalu is, is a song, um, is it, it's, I think it's like a praise to, the, do you know what it is, Michael? It's a praise to the, the land or something like that. It's, it's a dance. Right, yeah, okay, but it, I think it's, it's, it's some kind of um, praise of the land or some means of reconnection with the land, which, which in itself I think is really striking for, for someone like uh, Truyo, you know, who is, like La Ferriere has largely been a, an author of, of the city. And this return to the countryside and to, to effect that kind of healing, I think, was quite striking. And you find a sim similar thing in La Ferriere, um, L'Enigme du Retour, at the end of that. It's, it's, it's a book of mourning, mourning for his father. And again, uh, at the end of that book, the, the narrator figure um, undertakes this, this journey to the countryside. And it's a journey of rediscovery, and it's, um, it's not particularly spiritual or related to, to voodoo or religion, but it's, it, that's part of it, I think, but it, it's more of a reconnection with, with something that's, um, that, 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 that they've lost contact with. And it is about healing, and in that case, uh, about mourning as well. And you know, the final irony of, in these two works is that they were published a year, uh, yeah, I think the, just a year before the, the earthquake. You know, so you, you had this sense of nature being reincorporated into Haitian writing as, as some kind of um, force for, for healing, for, um, you know, in that turn away from the city that you get in these two books. But then you have the earthquake which comes and, um, you know, clearly a natural force which, um, which, which works against, you know, the, the, the idea of healing and brings in many new um, traumas. But in terms of religion as well, in, in Haitian writing, you'd, there's more of a concern, I think, with, um, not with voodoo, but with the, the growing influence of Protestantism, evangelicalism, you have various figures who, um, um, various characters presented who um, have either converted to evangelicalism, and, and it creates this kind of apocalyptic, um, or this apocalyptic view of, of Haiti and of the, this desire for the uh, for for the end times and for for Haiti to finally be delivered from um, from its past and for, from the um, the perceived um, wrongs of voodoo. So you do get that, that sense of, of interest with um, with uh, of with the Haitian literature, with the Protestantism, Protestantism and the growing influence of the, the evangelicals. Um, and just, just finally, the, on the question of infection and music and so on, it made me think of the, the example that you'll all know of Moreau de Saint-Méry, where he talks about the, the whites um, watching the, the voodoo ceremony, and um, at, at certain points, some of those, uh, have, some of these whites have been known to in a sense, catch the rhythm and to, to become part of, of the ceremony. So I think it's quite a telling early example of the ways in which you know, music um, can be seen as, can be felt as something which draws you into another sphere, you know, another um, culture, if you like, but also that that's seen as you know, something that, that is, is a threat to, to yourself. To, you're losing yourself and you're, you're catching something else which might be um, detrimental to yourself. And of course, people, uh, you know, practitioners uh, may uh, may interpret that that kind of action uh, very differently. I had a, a friend who a attended a Gaga, uh, you know, march with me one night. It was somebody who was just a st I was staying at a hospital in uh, in Leogun, and uh, so doctors visiting U doctors from the U.S. come down, and, and this one fellow wanted to go out with me, and I said, well, you know, you have to stay with me 
we go out, I'm not coming back. If you want to come back, he said, no, I'm going to go. So he was initially apprehensive because he heard, you know, reports, you know, the usual things uh, about, uh, about Gaga and voodoo practice. So he was uh, anxious about that. But when he got there, he, you know, listening to the music and people were welcoming him because, of course, I had brought him along. So, uh, and, you know, just sort of got really into the, the, the mood of, of the evening. And uh, this, as he's listening to the music and kind of getting into it a little bit more, he was dancing and then eventually became kind of frenzied. And, um, and when I looked, I was looking at this guy and thinking, you know, you know, what on earth? And, and I turned to a friend in, in the band and said, you know, what do you make of that? And uh, his response, I think, actually reflects sort of the flip side of, of this, this fear of voodoo contagion. Mm -hmm. Well, the guy said, you know, c'est pas fortni, right? It's not his fault, right? Yeah. Because, because uh, has the power, yeah. I mean, it has power. And, and clearly he was, he was tapping into this power, so he's recognizing, like my, my guest was recognizing this, this, this power that voodoo has. So, he, and he didn't see that as a particularly alarming thing. And if, if any of you had been there, I, I don't think anyone would, uh, you know, would, would view that through the lens of you know, so many you know, writers who have uh, you know, pathologized this, this kind of behavior. I mean, I think they would have seen somebody who's having a great time uh, and who was clearly being egged on by people in the band who thought that this was just great, that this guy was, uh, was getting into it, despite the fact that he had not had uh, exposure to it before. Now, I, I don't think that he was having you know, a, uh, you know, a, a possession trance, uh, but I do think, uh, I think he was moved mm -hmm. by this music on, on whatever level, you know, uh, and, uh, so I, I just think that uh, you know, you know, one person's sort of fearful, uh, fear of losing oneself uh, in possession can be another person's you know ecstatic embrace of, of something uh, f for whatever that's worth, uh, you know, at a particular moment. I can see uh, Isabel lurking on the steps. I think we have, we're slightly over time. I think yeah, we have to draw this to a close. But I hope we'll have time to, to reintroduce the, uh, all the participants uh, in the conference back to the concluding discussion when we finish. Um, and I'm sorry, I know you've got the mic in your hand and you didn't, yeah, uh, you didn't get spotted, unfortunately. Um, but I hope you can hold your question for later. I'm really sorry. Um, but we're going to start again. Um, it's 1.40 now, so um, we'll start again in an hour at... Um, 2.40. Yeah. Thanks very much. See you later. <laughs>